governors, alternate governors, temporary alternate governors, President Asakawa, good afternoon. My name is Mohammed Ehsan Khan. I'm the Secretary of the Asian Development Bank. Thank you for taking the time to participate in the business session of the second stage of the 55th annual meeting of the Board of Governors. I confirm that we have a quorum for this, this meeting. May I please request governors who are participating virtually to keep your cameras on, but switch off your microphones until the chair calls on you to deliver your statement. I now request the chair of the Board of Governors, the governor for Sri Lanka, his Excellency President Renil Vikram Singhe to start the business session. Mr. Chair, please. Good afternoon, Governors. President Asukawa, the meeting is called to order. I would like to welcome all of you to the business session of the 55th annual meeting of the Board of Governors of the Asian Development Bank. Let us first take up paragraphs 2 and 3 of the Procedures Committee report. With regard to the provisional schedule of the business sessions, document BG 55 -07, you will note that the schedule provides that we finish all the items in the agenda today. I note on the last item of document BG 5507, the request from the chair elect to forego delivery of his remarks. The provisions relating to the conduct of the meeting, as set out in document BG 5508, are similar as those adopted in the previous years. I take it that these two documents are acceptable and that we may approve of them as recommended by the Procedures Committee. In paragraph 1 of its report, the Procedures Committee has recommended the approval of the revised agenda as shown in document BG 55-06. If there is no objection, I declare that the revised agenda is approved. Let us now take up the committee's recommendation on the agenda items and start with agenda items 1 to 5 of our notation, which were approved by the Board of Directors. Item 1 is the annual report for 2021, and item 2 is the update to the rules and regulations. Item 3 is the budget for 2022, which encompasses the budget for the ADB and the ADB Institute as contained in document BG 55 stroke 10. <coughs> Item 4 is the st uh, status of the financial resources of the Asian Development Bank as contained in document BG 55 stroke 11. And Item 5 is the report to the Board of Governors on gender diversity at the ADB Board of Directors. As recommended by the Procedures Committee, I propose that the Board take note of these five items accordingly. Turning to item 6, the Committee recommends that the Procedures Committee of 2022-2023 stroke be composed of the Governors for Australia, Austria, the People's Republic of Bangladesh, the People's Republic of China, Italy, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Nepal, the Netherlands, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, the Independent State of Samoa, and the United States with the Governor for the Republic of Korea as Chair of the Committee. If there is no objection, I declare this recommendation approved. I congratulate the newly appointed members of the Procedures Committee. Finally, on item 7, the committee has recommended 
that the governor for the Republic of Korea be elected chair of the Board of Governors for 2022 stroke 2023 and that the governors for Canada and the Republic of Uzbekistan be elected vice chairs to hold office from the end of this meeting to the end of the 56th annual meeting of the Board of Governors. If there is no objection, I declare this recommendation approved. <clears throat> I have great pleasure in congratulating the Governor for the Republic of Korea on his election as Chair of the Board of Governors for 2022-2023. stroke I also congratulate the Governors for Canada and the Republic of Uzbekistan on their election as Vice Chairs for 2022-2023. <clears throat> At this point, allow me to say a few words as Chair of the Board of Governors. Fellow Governors, President Askawa, Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is my privilege to address you as the Chair of the 55th Annual Meeting of the Asian Development Bank. Today, member countries of ADB have gathered in person after three years here in this dynamic city of Manila for the second stage of the ADB annual meeting. First of all, let me express my sincere appreciation to the Asian Development Bank and the Government of Philippines for organizing this prestigious event. Amidst an unprecedented economic crisis that Sri Lanka is currently undergoing, we missed the opportunity to host the second stage of the annual meeting in Colombo. However, we are eagerly looking forward to welcoming you all in Colombo in the near future. The ADB has made a very positive impact, which is being profoundly felt across the entire region. In 2021, the ADB committed $22.8 billion to member countries and has mobilized an additional $12.9 billion in co-financing through partnerships with other sources. The ADB Strategy 2030 seeks to respond to global challenges, including climate change and natural disasters, food and energy insecurity, whilst also embracing opportunities in the digital economy, sustainable energy, and the leveraging technology for inclusive education and healthcare. Thus, the ADB has a crucial role in helping to shape and finance policies that improve people's lives and livelihoods across Asia and the Pacific. The supply chain shocks created by the COVID pandemic is compounded with the prices of global commodities, mainly food, fuel and fertilizer skyrocketing due to the Ukraine war. Higher food and energy prices are leading to the stuttering the growth of middle class and has resulted in further insecurity amongst the vulnerable communities in the Indian Ocean region. As a result of these shocks, there has been a spike in sovereign debt distress across emerging markets. The growth targets both in East Asia and South Asia, have been revised downwards. If this is not promptly addressed, it risks creating a contagion of debt distress that threatens growth and financial stability across all economies. Countries with pre-existing economic vulnerabilities, including Sri Lanka, are the most affected. Therefore, creditors and debtor nations must work collectively in an equitable manner to ensure economic and financial stability across the region and indeed the world. The developments on the global stage have further aggravated the self-inflicted economic crisis in Sri Lanka, resulting in a political outburst that led to a change in government. Today, 
We have stabilized the economy, and many countries and stakeholders are keenly monitoring how we resolve this crisis. Many nations are keenly watching developments in Sri Lanka to see how we engage with all stakeholders in finding a solution to this multifaceted crisis. We are well aware that the evolution of Sri Lanka's economic crisis includes both domestic policy elements as well as external shocks. It follows that the resolution of the crisis also requires both domestic efforts and the support of external partners. It is incumbent upon Sri Lanka and our creditors and the partners to set an example of how collaborative and good faith action can result in sustainable and equitable solutions to sovereign debt issues. Towards this end, we have already undertaken major macroeconomic policy reform measures. I am pleased to inform you that we have now reached a staff level agreement with the International Monetary Fund on a four year program supported by the extended fund facility. The program is aligned with the commitment of the government to implement an ambitious and comprehensive package of reforms that will help restore the sustainability of our public finances, addressing external imbalances, and restarting our growth engine through structural reforms and improvement in governance. Amidst major economic stress, Sri Lanka is undertaking an unprecedented fiscal effort as part of our commitment to restoring the country's debt sustainability. It's our hope and expectation that Sri Lanka's creditors and all stakeholders will support us in these efforts to restore our debt sustainability and help put the country back on the path of inclusive and sustainable economic growth. While Sri Lanka undertakes these deep and often painful reforms, we are exper experiencing rising unemployment and reduction in consumer purchasing power. The government is cognizant of the adverse impacts on the most vulnerable members of the society. Accordingly, every effort has been taken to allocate greater financing and resources towards targeted support for social protection. Asia still has still to overcome the present global economic crisis. Unlike the financial crisis of 2008, in this instance, the economic levers alone are insufficient to stimulate global economic recovery. The factors underlying the main crisis is not only of economic origin, but are also the consequences of evolving geopolitics. The results being the absence of cooperation amongst the G20 unlike the earlier crisis. The Ukraine war on one side and the US-China rivalry spurred on by military, trade and political differences on the other side are key contributors to this breakdown in cooperation. Added to this, geopolitical rivalry are the droughts, floods and pandemics which are still present in Asia. All these challenges are compounded by the absence of global leadership, a time when the global economy is stuttering. As this global rivalry intensifies into a new Cold War, which will determine a new global power balance by 2050, the inability of the major countries to give leadership to the mitigation of the global climate change crisis is becoming more apparent. Develop, developing Asia is facing a bleak future. Surging inflation, tighter monetary policies, declining in European output, weakening or exports is leading to a weaker economic prospects for South Asia and East Asia, as highlighted in our Asia Development Outlook 2022. Further, we are witnessing new alliances cutting across geopolitical rivalries to respond to the mitigation of global climate change further highlighting the absence of a common approach on this subject that is vital for our existence. The geopolitical rivalry to determine the contours of the Asian power balance by the mid-century 
has resulted in the inability of the major countries to give leadership to overcoming the key crises that are threatening the prosperity of the region. The resolution of these major economic and environmental issues is unfortunately interwoven with the global geopolitical crisis. As they say in many of our countries, when the elephants fight, it is the grass that is crushed. This is the predicament of many of our member countries. Therefore, we must overcome the geopolitical rivalries to address the major threats to our existence. Otherwise, we will all fail, leading to instability in our region, reminiscent of Europe after World War I. On the other hand, our ability to successfully meet these challenges will lead to remarkable process in raising the living standards of our people through the rise of the economies of our member countries. Before concluding, let me express my sincere gratitude to President Marcos and the people of Philippines for the outstanding hospitality and the excellent arrangements in organizing the ADB annual meeting. Thank you. <laughs> we will now proceed with the management's report to the Board of Governors. I would like to call on the President of the Asian Development Bank to deliver the report. President Askawa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Well, members of the Board of Governors, uh, we last met in May of this year uh, when we, you approved ADB's financial statements and allocation of net income. I spoke briefly to express my appreciation for your support, uh, which allowed us to continue ADB's important work. I also expressed my intention to deliver a full report later in the year if conditions allow. Governors, we have come together this week for our first in-person annual meeting since 2019. I welcome you to Manila and those joining online. I thank the Chair of our Board of Governors, His Ex Excellency, the President of Sri Lanka, and I thank the Government of the Philippines as we hold these meetings at ADB headquarters. I have said before that I believe we will be able to look back with pride at what ADB accomplished for the, uh, for the region during an unprecedented time of challenge. I am pleased to report that we have been delivering on our commitment to serve our developing member countries, DMCs, uh, through these challenges. We are also preparing carefully to support our DMCs through new uncertainties on their path to recovery. Let me begin with our performance last year, to, uh, 2021. Last year, ADB committed 22.8 billion US dollars in loans, grants, equity investments, guarantees, and technical assistance. Our COVID-related support amounted to 13.5 billion US dollars, including 4.1 billion dollars to facilitate vaccine access. Our private sector commitment totaled 4.3 billion US dollars accounting for about one quarter of our total number of committed projects. We provided $3.5 billion for climate change mitigation and adaptation. For the first time, 100%, 100% of our committed projects included elements that directly improve the lives of women and girls. Grants to our DMCs most in need totaled $193 million uh, through the Asian Development Fund, ADF. These very strong achievements uh, demonstrated our interconnected support for both pandemic response and long-term development priorities. They were enabled by our second largest borrowing program ever, which raised $35.8 billion US dollars through capital markets. We also sold a record volume, of, record volume of thematic bond. And for the first time, we issued blue bonds to improve ocean health 
and education bond. We launched innovative financing initiatives, including the Energy Transition Mechanism, ETM. Alongside our new energy policy, ETM demonstrates ADB's full commitment to support a just, clean energy transition. Let me turn now to the work that lies ahead to ensure strong and lasting growth as the region faces major downside risks, including flood secu food security, inflation, and debt. Allow me to stress three important operational directions. First, we are stepping up in our role as a climate bank for Asia and the Pacific. We are introducing the innovative finance facility, facility for climate in Asia and Pacific, or IFCAP. IFCAP holds great promise to scale up climate financing. We are also preparing a climate change action plan to help the DMCs achieve their uh, mitigation and adaptation goals. Second, we are addressing the setbacks uh, to social and economic progress from the pandemic, including learning losses for young people. Drawing on our ideas to scale up climate finance, we are exploring ways to leverage new levels of investment in education. We are also focused on health and social protection, with particular attention to women and girls, and to vulnerable groups, including aging populations. Third, we are ensuring that ADB's support evolves to respond to new uncertainties. This includes recognizing your concerns about a slowdown of invest in investment and, and higher borrowing costs. So, we are enhancing the role of policy-based lending for crisis response. We are working to strengthen domestic resource mobilization because it will lessen the reliance on external financing. We continue to build collective resilience through regional cooperation initiatives. And we are addressing food security with 14 billion US dollars in support from 2022 to 2025. This includes budget support and project and private sector finance. We are also strengthening food systems for the long term through climate smart agriculture and nature-based solutions. I appreciate that you have made this issue the focus of the gov governor's plenary tomorrow. Governors, in all areas I have described, we must ensure that our lower income, conflict affected, and small island developed mem members are not left behind. I urge your support for additional concessional resources under ADF. Before I conclude, let me note that our total commitments in the first half of 2022 this year were low compared to before the pandemic, but they showed an improvement by commitment volume over last year. As government ease restrictions and staff return to the field, we expect a return to, to pre-pandemic levels. We will also focus on the quality of our operations. I am also optimistic that our current organizational reforms will prepare ADB and its extraordinary staff to serve our developing member countries effectively in the coming years. At the same time, it is also important for us to act on the guidance from our board working groups, such as a report on gender diversity on the ADB board of directors. Governors, let me close by thanking you for your guidance and support for all of ADB's efforts to meet the evolving needs of our region. The people you represent continue to inspire us with their strengths and friendship. Those values will drive the work ahead of us as we strive for a more prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, President Asukawa. 
we will now proceed with the discussion to start the discussion let me call on the secretary to explain the conduct of this part of the meeting mr secretary thank you mr chair to have an orderly and constructive discussion and give sufficient time for governors to speak the order of speaking has been established in this regard i would like to remind the governors that the provisions relating to the conduct of the meeting uh, which have just been approved call on governors to keep their spoken remarks brief within the allotted time of 3 minutes for joint remarks 5 minutes will be allotted please be assured that your full written remarks will be entered in the summary of proceedings of the meeting to help governors pace themselves a system of warning lights has been installed on the screens in front of you we would request that the governors conclude their remarks as soon as possible after the turn, uh, light turns red headphones are provided for simultaneous interpretation channels for various languages are flashed on the screen please allow me to inform the procedure in case of disconnection for governors joining remotely and delivering their statements online in the event of disconnection the chair will proceed to the next speaker and give the floor to the speaker that was disconnected once the connection has been restored in the event that the connection cannot be reestablished the written statement will be included in the summary of proceedings with the chair's permission we propose to take a 5 minute break after each hour thank you and over to you mr chair distinguished governors mr president let me ask the governor for japan to make his intervention please use the headset to listen to the simultaneous interpretation of the governor for japan's remarks sumukagicho Mr. Chairperson of the Board of Governors, Mr. President, Governors, ladies and gentlemen, first, allow me to express my sincere gratitude to the host government of the Philippines for their warm welcome and President Asakawa and those at the ADB. Also, I express my deep appreciation for the condolences expressed by many countries to the passing of former Prime Minister Abe in attendance at the state funeral just held. In addition to the pandemic amid the compounding crisis of Russian continued aggression against Ukraine rising energy prices and food insecurity to re realize sustainable growth in in the Asia Pacific Japan focuses on the following five priorities first strengthening prevention preparedness and responses to the future health crisis and universal health coverage that contributes to this is important for sustainable economic growth japan expects adb to continue playing a leading role in this second quality education to expand education opportunities for students affected by school closures due to the covid Japan will support ADB's efforts through Japan Trust Fund. Third, support for vulnerable groups responding to food price hikes is important. Japan highly appreciates ADB's prompt financing support and will support measures against malnutrition through the Japan Trust Fund. Fourth, Energy transition respecting each country's circumstances and ownership is important. Energy transition mechanism is an extremely effective framework. We look forward to proactive contribution from other donors following Japan. Fifth, along with the debtor countries themselves undertaking reform efforts, coordinated support among all creditors is essential. Japan expects the ADB to work on this with other international institution to raise the transparency of the debt is also important 
Lastly, efforts in Pacific Island countries are also important. For the sustainable growth of the Asia and Pacific, Japan hopes that ADB under the leadership of President Asakawa will play a leading role. Thank you so much. I thank the governor for Japan. I now call on the governor for the Republic of Korea. Thank you, Chair, President Askawa, fellow governors. The past two years were a period of major transformation in Asia and the Pacific like never before. The unprecedented coronavirus left a deep scar in each and every member country. Fortunately, the reason has been bouncing back from the effect of the pandemic. But there are still challenges that we need to tackle together. I believe that the ADB, as a trusted partner in this region, will continue to play an active role going forward. And I'd like to take this opportunity to make a few suggestions on the directions of the ADB in the post-pandemic era. First, the ADB should continue to be a bank with solution. Sustainable growth in Asia and the Pacific is possible when it is underpinned by the physical infrastructure and soft infra infrastructures, meaning knowledge and solution for various sectors and themes. In that sense, Korea actively endorses KMAP, the action plan recently launched by the ADB to become a knowledge bank. Second, the ADB should become a bank that spearhead various types of finance. These days, the funds needed for large-scale development project cannot be easily mobilized with public funds or conventional means of financing alone. Going forward, the ADB should be at the helm in adopting new ways of financing so that either funds attracted from the private sector are channeled to the areas in need. In this context, Korea welcomes the ADB raising its climate finance ambitions to a hundred billion dollars until 2030. And I look forward to seeing the ADB play an active role. Third, the ADB should continue to be a bank that contributes to economic cooperation and integration within Asia and the Pacific. I look forward to seeing the ADB play a pivotal role in contributing to sustainable growth through regional cooperation and integration. As the host country for next year's ADB annual meeting, Korea will also work in close cooperation with the ADB to make the annual meeting a platform for unity of Asia and the Pacific. Thank you. I thank the governor for the Republic of Korea. I now call on the governor for the United States. Thank you, Chair. I am so pleased to represent the United States of America at this first in-person ADB annual meeting since 2019, and I am so pleased to see all of you. Thank you to our hosts, the Philippines, and to the chair of the Board of Governors, Sri Lanka. We gather at a time of unprecedented challenges and uncertainty, with COVID lingering, Russia's brutal and unprovoked war against Ukraine having severe negative spillovers and global financial conditions remaining tight. And all of this comes against the backdrop of an evolving world in which many of the biggest challenges, such as climate change, pandemics, fragility and conflict, cross borders and pose, in some cases, existential risks to our societies and economies, and also disproportionately affect the poorest and most vulnerable populations. The devastating floods in Pakistan are just the latest examples that global challenges can starkly 
translate into national and local challenges. In face of these many challenges, we have seen the ADB rise to the occasion. But to those who deliver, much more is asked. And so I say to President Asakawa, all of ADB management and staff, thank you. And I also say we will need even more from the ADB to meet the needs of our evolving world. Moving to specific topics, I will start with climate. Um, the United States is committed to boosting ambition and exhilarating global efforts to address the climate crisis. Failure to do so will undermine development progress and pose macro-critical risks. Um, in the United States, we have passed the Inflation Reduction Act, ushering in a new era for climate ambition. Here at the ADB, we welcome the role you're playing with the establishment, for example, of mechanisms like AFCAP and ETM. Going forward, we expect the ADB to meet its established climate finance goals and Paris alignment timelines, to set clear and ambitious private sector mobilization targets, and to address climate mitigation and adaptation and resilience with systematic adapta uh, assessments of adaptation um, as well as screening all investments for climate adaptation and resilience. Turning to food security, we commend ADB's efforts to implement its commitment under the EFI Action Plan for global food security and to enhance collaboration with partners to scale up support for food security in the MD DMCs. We urge ADB to lay out a clear medium to long-term plan for promoting sustainable investment in resilient, inclusive, and climate smart agriculture and food systems. And now I turn to infrastructure where the ADB has, is an important partner to meeting countries' vast infrastructure needs. Success will require increasing private sector mobilization as well as implementing key policy reforms. We encourage the ADB to develop the right instruments and vehicles to bring in private finance and we ask the bank to increase the granularity of its reporting to clearly distinguish between public and private mobilization. We appreciate the ADB support for its most vulnerable countries, and we thank you for the work you're doing to support the people of Afghanistan. Moving to internal issues quickly, as I see that the red is coming, we are pleased that ADB is undertaking the first full review of its safeguard policy in one decade. And we encourage the ADB to adopt a strong safeguard policy that builds on MDB practices and that ADB can and should be a leader in developing new approaches in relation to climate change and disadvantaged and marginalized people. Finally, for the ADB to successfully address the challenges of today and tomorrow, it must be a financially sustainable institution whose lending growth does not outstrip the organic growth of its capital. This will require a revamp of the bank's approach to risk governance, which should draw on the approaches of other MDBs. We look also to the ADB to implement the relevant recommendations of the recent G20 capital adequacy uh, report. I will end as President Asakawa did to conclude by noting again our appreciation for ADB's numerous contributions to securing a prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and Pacific. Thank you. I thank the Governor for the United States. I now call on the Governor for the People's Republic of China. Governors, let us turn our attention to the screens. Your Excellency President Vikramasinghe, Chairman of the Board of Governors, Mr. Asakawa, President of the ADB. Dear governors, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to attend the annual meeting. I'd like to thank the government of Sri Lanka, the government of the Philippines and ADB for their great work in organizing this annual meeting. Since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, ADB has launched effective measures to support developing member countries' response to the pandemic and foster economic recovery. PRC highly appreciates the leadership of the ADB management headed by President Asakawa and the staff's professionalism, dedication, and outstanding work. 
the prospects of the regional economic recovery have become more unstable and uncertain, posing challenges to poverty reduction and development. ADB should continue to uphold the principles of political neutrality and multilateralism. Adhere to the mandate of poverty reduction and the development, enhance capital mobilization capabilities, improve corporate governance, and make greater contribution to the stable recovery and shared prosperity of the Asia Pacific region. I'd like to make four recommendations. First, actively implement the ADB strategy 2030 to promote a green, resilient, and inclusive recovery in the Asia Pacific region. ADB should adhere to its ambitious climate financing goals, assist DMCs to enhance climate capabilities, and promote the green and low carbon transition. Help DMCs strengthen risk bearing capabilities in public health, food security, and natural disasters to enhance development resilience. Increase support for low income members and vulnerable groups to promote inclusive development and follow the trend of industrial and technological revolution. Support developing the digital economy and bridge the digital divide. Second, deepen regional cooperation and promote integrated development. ADB should advocate regional micro policy coordination, promote economic growth and maintain financial stability. Promote deeper cooperation in traditional areas such as infrastructure interconnectivity, while explore collaboration in new areas such as cross-border e-commerce and clean energy. Expand co-financing operations with AIIB and other developing partners and mobilize more private financing to broaden financing channels. Promote the coordination of CARIC and the GMS platforms with other initiatives such as the Belt and Road Initiative so as to form development synergy. Third, follow the trend of regional economic development and strengthen cooperation with upper middle income countries. As more DMCs are entering the upper middle income or even high income stage, ADB should attach greater importance to the mutually beneficial cooperation with UMICs. ADB's graduation policy should keep pace with the times, especially after the introduction of the differentiated of the differentiated pricing policy, it should be up to the DMCs to decide whether to continue borrowing or not. This will help ADB better serve its mission of supporting regional development. Fourth, continuously improve internal governance and enhance institutional capacity. ADB should take the opportunity of the ongoing organizational review and relevant reforms and further enhance institutional efficiency and the capacity to serve the clients. Meanwhile, ADB should ensure adequate capital strengths through avenues such as balance sheet optimization, as well as a general or special capital increase when necessary. Dear Governors, President Xi Jinping proposed the Global Development Initiative aiming at accelerating the implementation of the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and pursuing more robust, greener, and healthier global development. Asia Pacific is a region with the most dynamic growth and development potential in the world. PRC stand ready to work together with all parties and work diligently to promote the economic recovery and sustainable development of the Asia Pacific region and the world at large. Thank you. I thank the governor of the People's Republic of China. I now call on the governor for India. Governors, let us turn our attention to the screen. Thank you, Chair, distinguished governors, and President Asakawa. We are meeting in the backdrop of unprecedented inflation, tightening of monetary policies, slowdown of the global economy, supply chain disruptions, and geopolitical events. All of them endangering food security and livelihoods and development gains made so far. Despite these exogenous shocks and challenges, 
India's economic recovery has remained on course, supported by key structural reforms. India's reforms response has emphasized on supply side reforms rather than a total reliance on demand management. India today is focusing on infrastructure led capital spending aimed at enhancing productivity and employment while ensuring fiscal prudence with targeted interventions. And Asian Development Bank has been a highly valuable partner in our journey. We acknowledge Asian Development Bank's elevated climate ambition while retaining the focus on helping DMCs in meeting the SDGs. Besides embedding climate change components into each project to enhance the resilience and sustainability, the funding of direct climate change mitigation and adaptation at this scale is very essential. India emphasizes the importance of the principles of equity and common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. The transfer of low cost climate technologies from developed to developing countries has assumed critical importance and ADB can play the facilitator role to its knowledge partner role. Given the huge financing needs, the bank will need to mobilize additional resources. Review of ADB's capital adequacy framework, including net income transfers to prudentially, prudentially optimize the balance sheet is key to augment lending operations for MD DMCs. In addition, three complementary actions would be essential. One is strengthening ADB's equity capital to another round of general capital increase. Two, increasing private sector operations. Three, developing more affordable and innovating financing instruments. India envisages ADB to be a key facilitator for its member countries to strengthen regional cooperation and integration, enhancing regional value chains and regional public goods. India assumes presidency of the G20 from December 2022. I take this occasion for seeking member countries and ADB's support for India's forthcoming G20 presidency and particularly G20 finance track working groups. In conclusion, it is imperative that ADB as an organization and Asia as a region acts as an anchor for economic growth and continued development. I take this opportunity to assure India's continued support to ADB and all member countries. I hope that in unison, we can work towards achieving a prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and the Pacific. Thank you, Chair. I thank the Governor for India. I now call on the Governor for Indonesia. Governors, let us turn our attention to the screens. The Honorable President Ranil Vikramasinghe, Chair of the Board of Governor, Distinguished President Masasugu Asakawa, Fellow Governor, Alternate Governors, Ladies and Gentlemen. Let me begin by congratulating President Asakawa for his strong leadership in navigating ADB during this challenging time. We believe ADB has been and will remain relevant and responsive to member countries to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and now other challenges raised ahead. I would like to compliment the Board of Directors, Management, and staff for another year of excellence performance in maintaining ADB's strong presence in member countries, as well as maintaining its active role in global development. I also want to appreciate ADB for its continued support to Indonesia through financial and technical assistance, response to the COVID 19 pandemic, as well as partnership in various development areas. We will certainly continue our collaboration in the region to achieve inclusive development by focusing on the people well being, economic competitiveness, and build resilience toward climate change. 
I think the theme of our 55th annual meeting, which is positioning climate resilient green economy for the post-COVID-19 world, is highly relevant, timely, as well as important, which reflect the issues that are faced by all countries in the world. In the future, economic pressure will be more unpredictable, one of which is due to the risk of climate change. Indonesia has proven a strong commitment at the global level to climate change issue, and we integrate climate resilience consideration into our various fiscal policy and other policy. Together with the ADB, Indonesia has launched the Energy Transition Mechanism, or ETM, during the COP26 in Glasgow, November 2021. The ETM is an investment or financing approach or platform to retire coal power plants earlier than the original schedule and also to develop renewable energy facility in Indonesia. Indonesia ETM country platform was launched during the G20 third financial minister central bank governor meeting on July 2022 in Bali. This country platform is expected to serve as a framework to provide the necessary financing in a blended finance scheme for achieving the national energy transition by mobilizing both commercial and non-commercial funding sources in just and sustainable way. Indonesia and ADB will accelerate the conclusion and the implementation of the ETM program and also the country platform. We aim to announce the selected pilot project of ETM as one of our showcase at the G20 Leaders Summit in November 2022. In a few months, Indonesia will hand over the presidency of G20 to India. Nevertheless, our priority agenda, especially related to green economy and sustainable finance, will continue to challenge our innovative solution. And we must and we also have to work together to find the solution, especially during the current global environment in which higher interest rate and volatility becoming more and more eminent. Indonesia regional role as the upcoming ASEAN chairmanship in 2023 will also present an opportunity to provide leadership on the pressing challenging issue and we remain committed to address cur current issue that will bring the important position for ASEAN to the global community. We look forward to a stronger collaboration with the ADB and working with all ADB members as well as international partners to achieve a prosperous, inclusive, resilient and sustainable Asia and the Pacific and also the world. I hope you are all have a very productive meeting. Thank you and have a good day. I thank the Governor for Indonesia. I now call on the Governor for Australia. Governors, let us turn our attention to the screens. Good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to deliver this statement as Australia's alternate Governor to the Bank. I begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, from where I'm speaking today. I also thank the Government of the Philippines for hosting this important annual meeting. 
I'm so sorry that I'm unable to join you at this meeting in person, but look forward to opportunities to meet you in the near future. I start by commending the bank's continued efforts and the levels of support it's provided members in responding to the global pandemic. The ADB's crisis response efforts and the unprecedented financial support for health, education and social protection for the most vulnerable have been pivotal for low and middle income countries in our region. More than two years after the onset of the pandemic, we're still grappling with its health and economic impacts. While the health situation in our region is improving, we remain in a period of severe disruption and uncertainty. Commodity price shocks, increasing inflation, tighter financial condition and increased risks around the debt distress will be felt most by the poorest countries and their most vulnerable populations. These fragilities and pressures are exacerbated by Russia's illegal invasion of the Ukraine. It is critical as ever that the ADB continues to stand by and assist developing members drawing on its significant expertise and knowledge tailored to the specific needs of countries. In this context, concessional financing to support the poorest and most vulnerable countries remain vital. Given the unprecedented financial assistance that the ADB has provided our members and future development financing needs, it's important that the ADB continues to make best use of its resources and balance sheet and crowd in private sector finance. The pandemic continues to highlight the structural vulnerabilities of small island states. These countries in our region have been among the hardest hit by the economic crisis and remain susceptible to multiple shocks. We welcome the bank's role in supporting these states. We reiterate the need for flexible and tailored approaches to financing, technical assistance and debt in small island states that take into account structural limitations and do not overwhelm existing capabilities. The inaugural FCAS annual report highlights and reinforces the need for differentiated approaches in dealing with small island states and fragile and conflict afflicted situations. The Pacific approach adopted last year is an important policy strategy that Australia supports. The ADB's ambitious vision on climate change is very welcome, as is its increasing role as the region's climate bank. We commend the bank for looking to tackle this challenging issue through innovative solutions and approaches. I also encourage the ADB to consider unique circumstances of Pacific Island countries and the challenges they face in accessing climate finances. Australia is committed to supporting enhanced climate action in our region through increased climate finance and new partnerships in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. The Australian Government has initiated a review of new forms of development finance to help countries in our region achieve their development climate objectives. The review will also examine how we can continue to build on our strong partnership with the multilateral development banks, including the ADB. We also welcome the second report presented to the Governors on Gender Diversity at the ADB Board of Directors. This is an important body of work that Australia supports and looks forward to continued progress towards gender diversity. I'd like to finish by taking a moment to thank Executive Director Mr Tony McDonnell, who will be concluding his term at the end of this year. Tony's made a significant contribution to the bank and in representing our constituency and has served with distinction. I'd also like to thank members in our constituency for electing Ms Rachel Thompson to the Executive Director role. 
With Ms Thompson election, we are also proud to note that she will be the first female executive director to represent the constituency. This is a magnificent thing. Once again, I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person. I wish you all the very best for your deliberations at this important meeting, and I look forward to catching up with you all again soon. I thank the Governor for Australia, and I call upon the Governor for Canada. Thank you, Chair. I would like to thank the ADB President and his team for organizing the annual meeting of the Board of Governors. I also thank the government and the people of the Philippines for warmly welcoming back ADB governors and delegations. I commend the ADB for its rapid and significant response to COVID-19 over the past two and a half years. While we are seeing the beginning of recovery from the pandemic, it will take time to regain the social and economic losses incurred. We have come very far together in combating COVID-19, but it is equally important that we do not lose ground on other health gains made over the decades, including on routine vaccination, nutrition, and sexual and reproductive health and rights. Canada remains guided by its feminist international assistance policy and continues to urge a feminist approach to the implementation of Strategy 2030. Women and girls have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. In this context, I welcome the bank's efforts to mainstream gender equality by ensuring that at least 75% of the ADB's projects are beneficial to women and girls. We applaud the surpassing of this target. Addressing climate change is also critical. The devastating floods we have observed in Pakistan during the past weeks are a reminder of the critical work required to meet our targets for climate change mitigation and adaptation. I congratulate the ADB on its commitments to increase cumulative climate financing by 2030, increase financing for resilience and adaptation, and align its investments with Paris Agreement goals. Climate change and biodiversity loss know no borders. Canada has committed to doubling its climate finance to 5.3 billion Canadian dollars for the 2021-2026 period to help developing countries transition to low carbon, climate resilient economies. The ADB remains a key climate finance partner for Canada, particularly through the Canadian climate funds for the private sector in Asia which are expected to reduce emissions by over 20 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent. The commitments and challenges ahead require that we use development finance tools in the most effective and efficient manner possible. As we approach the midterm review of ADF 13, I therefore welcome discussions of how we can ensure its ongoing effectiveness, particularly for the most vulnerable in small island developing states and fragile and conflict-affected situations. I also welcome the report of the G20 Independent Review of MDB Capital Adequacy Frameworks and look forward to discussions and an action plan from management on implementing its recommendations. Thank you. I thank the Governor for Canada and now call upon the Governor for Philippines. <coughs> ADB Board of Governors, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The ADB is the Philippines' second largest provider of ODA assistance with combined loan and grant commitments amounting to more than 9 billion US dollars. In addition, the bank has pipelined additional assistance to the Philippines amounting to 12.2 billion US dollars. The continuing support of the ADB is critical to the achievement of the Marcos administration's vision for the Philippines in the next six years. To guide this vision, the Philippine government has mounted a comprehensive eight-point socioeconomic agenda that aims to propel the Philippines to upper middle income country status by 2024 and bring down the poverty incidence to a single digit of 9% by 2028. Environmental sustainability is embedded in our plans and aspirations. We cannot attain these lofty goals without addressing climate change. 
This leads me to underscore that multilateral cooperation and concessional funding assistance for DMGs, DMCs rather, will remain to be the most effective tools in ensuring a sustainable and inclusive recovery. As we position climate resilient green economies for the post-COVID-19 world, concessional financing support of multilateral development banks or MDBs in the energy sector and other related climate financing initiatives are fundamental to our Philippine transition pathway. Bilateral and multilateral partnerships have allowed the Philippines to integrate best practices and standards towards a healthier, greener, and more resilient economy. The ADB has provided generous support to our climate change adaptation and mitigation efforts through the Energy Transition Mechanism Facility, Climate Investment Fund, and Climate Change Action Program. In 2022, we tapped the international capital markets with the issuance of our first ever sustainability global bonds and samurai bonds, which secured strong demand from investors. The Philippines continues to closely work with the international development partners, such as the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action and the Nationally Determined Contributions Partnership to contribute to the mission of global green recovery. Ultimately, MDBs deliver innovative financing solutions and technical knowledge in the areas of environmental sustainability, social inclusion, and good governance, which help developing countries like ours achieve sustainable development goals. It is thus imperative now more than ever that we scale up the capacity of MDBs and help them recover barriers to providing sustainable support. To this end, we encourage donor countries to provide MDBs with additional funding through capital infusion and advanced scheduled replenishments. Furthermore, improved collaboration between public development banks and MDBs will increase bank capacities and provide a better understanding of local financial landscape. Concrete forms of such cooperation, including loans between institutions, co-financing, technical assistance, portfolio exchanges between MDBs, and guarantees between banks will enable increased lending. We look forward to intensifying our partnership with the ADB and other development partners as we pursue a greener and more inclusive society. Thank you. I thank the governor for Philippines and call upon the governor for Germany. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. President, fellow governors. I thank the Republic of the Philippines for stepping in to host this annual meeting. And at the same time, I would like to take this opportunity to express to the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka as designated host of this annual meeting our full understanding for the difficult situation. Please allow me to begin with offering my sympathies also to the government of Pakistan. Germany has responded quickly and has made 26 million euros available to help ease the hardship. The world, fellow governors, is facing multiple crises. The pandemic, rising food prices and growing costs for adaptation to climate change pose huge challenges. Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine has caused energy prices to skyrocket. Developing renewable energies will mitigate climate change while also reduce fossil fuel dependencies. A successful energy transition is the best form of strategic protection for every country and cannot be left to wait any longer. Asia and the Pacific are once more facing hard decisions. We have to join hands here. I would like to make special mention of the crisis response by ADB and the collective offer by the G7 to support just energy transition partnerships to phase out of fossil fuel and promote socially just and sustainable energy transition. Injustices become even more evident during crises. Society where there is gender equality, on the other hand, are more resilient and develop stronger economies. 
In view of special disadvantages experienced by women and girls, Germany is consistently implementing a feminist development policy. And I expect ADB also to make contributions here. Making the world more just has been a focus during Germany's G7 presidency. With our G7 partners, we have reached agreement on important initiatives. These aim at accelerating the international climate agenda, mobilizing public and private funding for sustainable infrastructure and working on global shield against climate risks, offering support in the case of loss and damages. In addition, we also want to strengthen global health and launch a global alliance for food security. ADB has and will continue to be an important partner in these initiatives. Germany wants to make sure that ADB will continue to be able to support the region. Safeguarding its capital and preserving the AAA remains the basis for our business model. So we encourage ADB to thoroughly examine the recommendation of the independent G20 expert panel on capital adequacy frameworks. The fight against climate change demands political leadership, and I believe President Massa lived up to that in Glasgow. In order to achieve the climate finance goals, he has said the bank will need to redouble its effort. It also sees an, um, I also see an important role for ADB in improving framework conditions in borrowing countries so that they are more easily able to access international climate finance. Let me conclude by thanking ADB for making a contribution also to Afghanistan, including the efforts to focus on women and girls in view of the disastrous condition in that country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor for Germany. Governors, we will be having a five-minute break.
uh, governors. Uh, I would request you to uh, take your seats so we can resume the session. Uh, at this point, I would like to introduce the alternate governor for Sri Lanka, Secretary to the Treasury, Mr. Mahinda Srivardhane, to take the chair. Mr. Secretary, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Governors, thank you for returning to your seats. I now call on the governor for the United Kingdom to make his intervention. Thank you very much, Chair, President, colleagues, and thank you also to the Government of Philippines for your generous hospitality for these annual meetings. I want to start by stressing that the UK is committed to deepening our cooperation with Asia and the Indo-Pacific region, and stressing that we see the Asia Development Bank as a key partner in the region for supporting green, resilient growth and reducing poverty. It's been three years since the governors last met in person, three years of global crisis and challenge. The pandemic devastated lives and livelihoods. The climate emergency poses an increasing threat. And now Russia's unprovoked aggressive invasion of Ukraine has compounded these challenges with global inflation and food insecurity. It's clear that countries Countries, businesses, and people from across the region require the bank's financing and advice more than ever before. We do think the bank has responded well. It's responded strongly with pace, with energy, and with innovation, including supporting vaccine procurement and most recently announcing $14 billion to support countries, to support the bank's clients, to tackle food insecurity and we urge continued pace and careful and sharp targeting in using this money well to tackle the challenges countries are facing right now. We welcome that the bank is a world leader in healthy oceans issuing its first ever blue bond last year to finance sustainable projects in Asia and the Pacific but more must be done to meet the region's needs. The bank has come a long way from investing in coal power just nine years ago to becoming now a leader on renewable energy today. But the bank must continue to strengthen its leadership role on climate change, delivering on important commitments it made ahead of COP26. And these include formalizing the target to provide 100 billion in climate finance by 2030, fully aligning with the Paris Agreement by 2023, and implementing the Multilateral Development Bank's joint statement on nature, people, and planet. And looking ahead to COP27, we urge the bank to accelerate support for just energy transitions, particularly for those countries moving from coal to clean energy, and we welcome the innovation in the work on the energy transmission mechanism and the IFCAP. The UK remains a committed partner in all of this work. To help its members deal with the compound crisis they are facing, the bank must also scale up its financing. The G20's independent review of the MDB capital adequacy framework has made recommendations that could release hundreds of billions of dollars of additional financing from the ADB and other MDBs, and we would like the bank to provide the board of directors with an assessment of each of the recommendations, including their potential impact on its financing capacity. Of course, public finance can only go so far, so the bank must also set out a plan for mobilizing more private investment across the region, and we would like to see this before COP27. I'd like also to welcome the work the bank has done for responding with new innovation when shocks occur and preventing economic scarring with its new crisis toolkit. And we would like to urge the bank to build on this by offering climate resilient debt clauses in all its loan agreements. These would enable an automatic pause in repayments when a shock hits 
creating fiscal space to respond. So a lot to do for the bank, but a lot that has been achieved over the last year. I look forward to deepening the UK's partnership with the bank in these areas. Together, we can help build a safer, greener, and more, pro more prosperous region. Thank you. I thank the Governor for the United Kingdom. I now call on the Governor for Pakistan to make his intervention. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Excellencies, Chairman of the Board of Governors from Sri Lanka, President of the Asian Development Bank, fellow governors, alternative governors, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the management of Asian Development Bank and the government of Philippines for facilitating us in the event for these last three days and making it very comfortable for us. We thank you for that. I am touched by the support I have received from all friends here on the ongoing floods which are there since July of this year and we are still in that process. It's not stopped. I am thankful for their support, their messages of condolence and whatever way they have supported us is extremely valuable and encouraging for us. I would like to take this opportunity to warn all of you, please consider this as a climate warning. We might not be taking it as seriously as we think, but let me share a few things with you which might open your eyes. Pakistan's greenhouse emissions are less than 1%, but Pakistan is suffering and we are the, maybe the fourth or the fifth worst affected country in the world. We were expecting 40% more rain than the average of, um, uh, of the last 30 years. But we got rain which was 300%, 500%, 700%, 1000% and 1700% more than what average we had in the last 30 years. Um, we used to have ravine flooding due to the melting of the glaciers, but this time it came from the sky. For days it rained, not in the mountain areas where it used to, uh, where the floods used to come from, but this was from the sea. It rained for days where we were not able to provide food, medicine, any kind of relief, as no helicopters could do, go there, and the roads were cut off, the railways was cut off, it was next to impossible to see people dying of hunger and not being able to provide them relief. We did whatever we could. Why I want to share? Because I don't want any other country to share, uh, to, to go through the same fate as we did. So it's a warning. 33 million people have been displaced. We've heard of refugees, but these are refugees within their country. They are homeless. They're on the roads, they're in the open, without tents, without medicine, without food. They're still on the road since June. We are providing them whatever we can. 33 million means there are many countries whose population is not 33 million, but let's open our eyes. We don't want anyone else to be next. Thousands of acres of land is underwater. 1,600 people have died. More than one million animals have died. More will die because there's no fodder to feed them. And the disease is there. 13,000 kilometers of highways, motorways and roads have been washed away. 400 bridges have been washed away. 22,000 schools are either damaged or destroyed with about 3.5 million students. Which two school they will go to, we don't know as yet. How will they study in the extreme heat or the winter? We are still not aware of that. How long will it take to rehabilitate? That an answer we still don't have because we are still in the process of rescue since July this year. 13,000 hospitals have been damaged or destroyed. 600,000 expecting mothers are sitting in the open sky without medical aid, without 
nutritious food for the newborns which we are trying to deal with to the best of our ability. 18,000 lady health workers who were supposed to give support to, to the, uh, the far-flung areas uh, of Pakistan, they, are, they don't have any homes, they are on the roads. Crops, cotton crop is destroyed, dates is destroyed, rice is destroyed. We used to export these items. We, we are exporters of cotton-made products. We used to export wheat, rice. I think we might be importing them. Um, this time we had a winter, and the spring did not come. The winter was taken over by the heat wave, and the summer came without a spring. 54 degrees was the temperature for days and days. In that, so in that heat, it's easy to say, but you can boil an egg on the bonnet of a car. And people are there without roofs sitting there. It's not that hot now, but the, because of the climate change, we have seen this kind of temperature. We have to open our eyes. We have to tackle and deal with it. After another few months, I feel we will forget what happened there. Pakistan won't forget, because we are going to live with it for years and years to come. It's billions and billions of dollars which we'll have to spend to rehabilitate. We are paying uh, to the poorest of the poor some cash subsidies also, and Asian Development Bank has been very supportive in that also. But after a few months, the world will forget there was this disaster. You could be next. Please think about it. Find a way to stop this, because we don't want anyone else to suffer. Suffer. We had, uh, we had floods in 2010. 20 million people were affected. This time, 33 million. We started working on climate change in 2010. The infrastructure that we were, uh, we were uh, uh, establishing was all climate resilient. But we never knew that this kind of rain, where it never used to rain for two years in a row, it never used to rain even a day. It rained 500 times the average of 30 years. So whatever we are doing, we are keeping in mind, it has to be climate resilient. It has to be focused. We have to fight together. We, we, are coming, we have announced a solar policy, which we did earlier, but that is not enough. <clears throat> we, are, uh, we, we have gone for massive plantation, uh, solar policy, plantation, um, electric vehicles, everything we are moving towards that. But I think we are already very late. Our experience says the world took a long time to decide. And still, if we don't act fast, it's going to be disastrous for our brothers and sisters. One life lost anywhere in the world is losing of uh, humanity. It's as precious as it is in Pakistan. So please, I urge all of you to focus and find a way forward. Please, it should be targeted what we need to do, how we need to uh, focus on that, and what are the targets which we need to achieve and time that is required. 30 year, 2030, what we are also planning, might be too far away. I thank you all for listening to me patiently. I hope I haven't taken more time than it was allocated. Wanted to say a lot of things, but I once again thank Asian Development Bank and all friends sitting here for the kind support they've given us. Thank you. I thank the governor for Pakistan. I now call on the governor for New Zealand. Can I acknowledge the message from the governor of Pakistan, first and foremost? Tēnā koutou katoa, warm Pacific greetings to you, Chair, all the Honourable Governors and President uh, Sakawa. Can I thank the government and peoples of Philippines for their support of this meeting?
can I also acknowledge our Pacific governors individually and collectively who are present. It's my great pleasure to make these remarks to you in person as we gather for the first time since the annual meeting in Fiji 2019. We meet at a time of multiplying crisis with rapidly growing food insecurity as well as an energy crisis driven by the supply chain shocks from the pandemic and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The economic effects of the pandemic continue to linger. The impacts of the climate crisis are becoming more and more visible every day and geopolitical tensions are becoming stronger headwind to collective action and multilateral solutions. The ADB's mission to build cooperation and integration across our region has never been more important and the Asia Development Fund must continue to play an essential role. President Nasakawa, we welcome the major program of reforms that you have initiated to ensure that the bank can deliver on Strategy 2030's vision. We support transformation within the bank and scaling up support to address the climate crisis and we look forward to partnering with ADP as we deliver our own scaled up grant-based climate finance of 1.3 billion to 2025. A long-standing priority of Aotearoa New Zealand is for the ADB to improve how it delivers less bureaucracy, more flexibility and tailored ways of working that are fit for purpose, particularly for smaller members. This is where we see the greatest value to be achieved in the organisational review alongside a stronger focus on digital transformation. We call on ADB to deliver with urgency on an ambitious modernisation of its ways of working in the next few years. Mr Chairman, the coming years will continue to be very challenging for our members. The recent G20 expert panel review of NDP's capital adequacy frameworks offers a number of recommendations to unlock greater levels of vital development finance. While it will ultimately be for us as shareholders to collectively respond to these recommendations, management is best placed to advise on each of the recommendations during the upcoming Capital Adequacy Framework Review. Finally, Aotearoa New Zealand strongly welcomes the second report to the Board of Governors on Gender Diversity at the ADB Board of Directors, and I thank the directors for their continued commitment to addressing this issue. As the report notes, it is the collective responsibility of the current board and the membership represented by governors to consider the report's useful insights into the underlying reasons why there continues to be such an imbalance and offers practical actions on a range of stakeholders could take. I just want to conclude with my remarks to help underscore how important gender balance and gender diversity is to us in Aotearoa New Zealand. One of our chiefs have often said, give a man a fish and he will feed himself. Give a woman a fish and she will feed the children and her family. She may even sacrifice her own portion for her neighbour's children. Thank you for listening. I thank the Governor for New Zealand. I now call on the Governor for Malaysia. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat petang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your Excellency, Mr. President of ADB, distinguished governors, honourable board members, ladies and gentlemen. Post-COVID is unlike unlikely to return the world it was, which calls the need for us to balance between economic recovery and containing inflation. Malaysia has responded to the rising cost of living by providing subsidies and social assistance, amounting at the billion ringgit Malaysia this year. Notwithstanding the inflation situation, is Malaysia is well managed and is considered among the lowest in the region by the ADB. Malaysia welcomes ADB facilitations efforts towards climate resilient economy with the cumulative climate financing amounting 
to 100 billion USD for the period 2019-2030 for its developing member countries. Malaysia recognizes the importance of a just transition towards sustainability. A case in point is the issuance of the work the world's first sovereign US dollar sustainability suku by the Malaysian government in April 2021 to the value of 800 million USD, which was oversubscribed by 6.4 times across the world. In this light, Malaysia welcomes member countries to be part of our journey in leveraging Islamic capital market synergies for a climate resilient economy. Malaysia believes. ADB can play a more important role in strengthening public health care post-pandemic to ensure health care and ensuring a fiscal resilience. In this perspective, Malaysia calls for deeper regional cooperation and integrations between ADB and member countries for successful development strategies implementation. Another global concern is the increasing percentage of aging populations and increased life expectancy, which put further pressure on the declining population growth in several member countries, including Malaysia. This phenomenon, coupled with low fatality rate, will cause labour market facing shortages of needed supply and may indirectly impair climate resilient economic growth. As such, ADB assistance is sought for development of an inclusive and forward-looking policy framework in raising the fertility level in affected member countries' populations. Malaysia expresses the importance for member countries in promoting both biodiversity and green economy for a sustainable and inclusive recovery. Malaysia looks forward to continue technical assistance and capacity buildings by ADB, especially to non-borrowing members' countries like Malaysia, that would support in identifying green assets as well as the development of a coherent approach in managing climate and environment-related risks. Together, governors, we can build a better economy for the people and make these regions more competitive, prosperous, sustainable and resilient. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the Governor for Malaysia. I now call on the Governor for Italy to make his intervention. Thank you, Mr. Chair of the Board of Governors. Thanks to the Government of the Philippines for their great hospitality to President Azakawa, fellow Governors and alternates. The COVID-19 response represented the bulk of AD operations over the past two years. We commend ADB for responding in a timely and flexible fashion. I will focus on four challenges the bank has now to face in a context made even more complex by Russian's aggression against Ukraine. First, how to move forward in the health sector. There is a need to refocus from vaccine support to long-term objectives. These include building more resilient health systems, developing early warnings, making progress towards universal health coverage, and promoting regional pharmaceutical private manufacturing capacity. To reinforce health systems against future pandemic risks, the Financial Intermediary Fund for Pandemic Prevention, Preparedness and Response, hosted by the World Bank, is a new tool at our disposal, established thanks to the effort of the G20 Joint Finance and Health Task Force, co-chaired by Indonesia and Italy. The fund will help mobilize additional international financial resources to support low- and low-middle-income countries through eligible implementing entities, which include the ADB. Second, how to fulfill the commitments on climate change. Over the past two years, the bank performance against its commitments has been below expectations, for reasons we can understand. We welcome the ADB's renewed ambition in this area and ask to pursue the targets with determination. Third, how to rethink the approach to non-sovereign operations. On private sector, Italy is very supportive of operations promoting inclusive growth and development. 
At the same time, we remain mindful about the need for additionality, particularly financial additionality. Operations in areas of potential financial market failures offer promising investment opportunities and should be pursued further. They include support to startups, micro and small enterprises and microfinance, as well as resource mobilization for merit goods, such as green public transportation and innovative renewable resources. Fourth, how to manage the transition from budget support to project financing. Current global challenges justify developing member countries' growing demand for budget and emergency support. Nonetheless, MDBs should remain anchored to their core mandate. This is to support long-term development interventions and build institutional capacity for crisis prevention and management, making limited use of emergency assistance. We expect the ADB to make prudent use and ensure how quality and develop an impact of this kind of operations. We therefore appreciate ADB's positive response to recommendation for the use of policy-based lending. Let me conclude by reaffirming our support for ADB's ambition. At the same time, it will be important to ensure the long-term financial sustainability of the bank and to recognize and manage the trade-offs. In this regard, we welcome the ADB's active engagement in the G20 independent review of MDB's capital adequacy framework. We believe that the panel's recommendation can provide useful guidance for the ADB to adopt measures to manage its capital in line with best practices while protecting its rating and optimizing use of its resources. Thank you. I thank the Governor for Italy. I now call on the Governor for France to make his intervention. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of France, I would like to extend first my gratitude to the Philippines government for hosting this annual meeting, the excellent organization and the warm hospitality we received. The Asian Pacific region is still very much impacted by the multiple ongoing crisis. In this context, we welcome once again ADB's swift, ambitious response. We are, however, convinced that beyond crisis response, ADB should gradually return to its core mandate and focus on longer-term investments to pave the way for green, sustainable, resilient, and inclusive recovery. We commend and support the Bank's commitment to deliver climate financing to its members in a cumulative amount of $100 billion between 2019 and 2030 from its own resources, together with the commitment to align its portfolio with the Paris Agreement. We encourage ADB to continue to build up its pipeline to allow re the ramping up of its climate activity, including with climate PBLs, and in particular by supporting just energy transition partnerships. We urge the bank to dedicate all its efforts, especially in the context of the ongoing organizational review, to truly become the climate bank for Asia and the Pacific. In this context, ADB has to carefully weigh the trade-offs between short-term and long-term needs. We note that ADB's crisis response came at a cost these past two years, increased lending volumes, deteriorating portfolio quality or further concentration of portfolio have all impacted ADB's financial margins. We are concerned by the combined decline of the lending headroom and increase of the capital utilization ratio with the possibility to reach some alarm zones in the near future. In the context of the G20 discussions of MDB's capital adequacy frameworks, the best call on ADB to explore all possible options to manage even better its capital in its capital adequacy framework review that is starting soon and provide shareholders with a sound analysis of their respective impact as well as timeline of possible implementation. To fully support Asia's sustainable recovery, ADB should continue to systematically pay special attention to debt sustainability further mobilize private co-financing, and continue mainstreaming gender equality in staff and board. In addition, in a context of multifaceted crisis environment, the Asian Development Fund has to maintain its commitment in the coming years to support the poorest and most fragile countries. Finally, France would like to commend ADB staff for their achievements over the past two years. We are conscious that crisis response and financial support came at a price for staff in terms of prolonged heavy workload and impacted their well-being. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the powerful statement from our Pakistan uh, governor earlier on. Thank you very much.
I thank the governor for France. I now call on the governor for Thailand to make his intervention. Chairman of the Board of Governors, President of the ADB, fellow governors, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the government of Thailand, I would like to express my appreciation to the ADB and the government of the Philippines for hosting this annual meeting, the first in-person meeting for over two years. Since the beginning of 2020, the world has faced unprecedented challenges from the COVID-19 pandemic, with its impact being felt in almost all aspects of life. Thankfully, the ADB's response has been timely and tremendous. I highly appreciate the ADB financial assistance of over 20 billion US dollars to counter the severe impacts of the pandemic and to procure and deliver vaccines under the Asia Pacific Vaccine Access Facility. As we look into the future, environmental issues are the first ones that spring to mind. We have seen extreme weather events all over the world, a result of climate change caused by the human activities. In response, the world has made climate a key agenda in many international fora. We should build on this momentum to make the world cleaner and greener. This requires immediate thinking from policymakers to address these challenges, whether it be integrating sustainable, develop, sustainable development and a just transition into macroeconomic policies, allying economic growth with social and environmental objectives, and investing public funds in greening the economy. Therefore, Thailand has support positioning climate resilient green economy for the post-COVID-19 world the current ADB theme for the annual meeting. The theme has come at the right time and would pave step forward the future of resilient and sustainable recovery. In, ali in alignment with the ADB's theme, Thailand has put the bio-circular green economic model as a new national agenda. The model will enable sustainable development goals through the promotion of sustainable agriculture clean energy and responsible consumption and production. Creating a climate resilient and green economy cannot be done individually. Rather, it requires a concerted effort from various economies. I'm confident that the ADB would play a crucial part, be the mobilizing funding, providing support and assistance, and sharing knowledge and best practices. To this end, I would like to encourage fellow members to support the agenda for this year's annual meeting and work together to foster a sustainable and inclusive growth in our region. Thank you very much. I thank the governor for Thailand. I call on the governor for Maldives to make his intervention. Thank you, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, Excellency uh, President Massa, uh, Chair of the Board of Governors, Distinguished Governors, Assalamu Alaikum, and a very good afternoon. Firstly, let me thank, uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, President Massa and ADB team for the continued support uh, in the development of the Maldives. Uh, the Maldives is a small nation of around 1,190 islands. 99% of our territory is the ocean. Our livelihoods are dependent on the health of our natural resources. The lifeblood of our economy are the tourism and fisheries industries. Due to this dependency, our economy contracted by 33% during the pandemic, one of the hardest hit in the world. While we were able to rebound fast from the pandemic, achieving a 36% growth rate in 2021, we are again tackling the impacts of the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war. Global fuel and food prices have substantially increased. This is a major financial risk for our country, for a country that depends heavily on imports like the Maldives. This brings me to highlight on the urgent and critical need to ramp up investments in renewable energy. Today, aside from the volatile global economic environment, we are dealing with the climate emergency, which not only poses an economic and developmental challenge, but also threatens our islands and affects our way of life through, the risk, through high risk of damages. 
Recent scientific assessments produced by the IPCC portray bleak prospects, reconfirming that small and low-lying island states are among the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and the associated sea level rise. The IPCC calls for greater investments uh, financially and technically in supporting climate vulnerable countries to adapt to the ongoing and project, projected impacts of climate change. Sadly, when talking about climate finance, the world has failed to di direct these funds to countries, those who are in need, and meet the commitments. Every day spent without access to these much important climate finance we are forced to spend from our national budget. But in each meeting like this, we hear more about more commitments. We cannot wait for these funds while our islands are being eroded every day. I urge everyone to take this seriously. Every year, we allocate millions of dollars from our national budget and donor funding for climate adaptation and mitigation simply to exist. Funds that could be invested to achieve other targets we have set, such as achieving net zero by 2030. Funds that we urgently could use to transition towards climate, uh, towards cleaner energy transition. With the right policy incentives, climate change mitigation can be financed at scale and relatively quickly. I call on the ADB, other development partners and friendly bilateral nations to assist us in our journey to transition towards renewable energy. Your Excellencies, during the height of the pandemic, we witnessed how the global world mobilization helped to raise funding and develop vaccines in a historically short amount of time. Today, in the face of the double crisis, the same levels of solidarity, energy, and urgency are needed. Thank you very much. I thank the governor for Maldives. I now call on the governor for Hong Kong, China, to make his intervention. Chairman, President Maza, fellow governors, I'm very pleased to present Hong Kong, China at this annual meeting of ADB. And I would like to thank the Philippine government as well as ADB for the efforts made to make this happen amid the ongoing pandemic challenges. Similar to ADB, we also have um, just lifted our hotel quarantine arrangements, so in such a way that Hong Kong is also back. At the same time, we're definitely open for business as usual and welcome all of you to come going forward. We are all on the pathway to achieve green and sustainable, at the same time resilient recovery. Unlike other pathways, I think we don't start with our feet, but we have to do it top down, start with our mindset on our brain. And with that in mind, I think there has to be a clear collective connectedness awareness in terms of what the objectives that we seek to achieve. And with that in mind, I think there are three Ds that I want to highlight here. First of all is the need to decarbonize, which is decarbonization. And in that regard, the ADB's commitment to increase the climate action financing to 100 billion US dollars by the year 2030 and to align all its operations with the Paris Agreement by 2050 are more than important. Insofar as Hong Kong is concerned, like what President Massa just mentioned, we also have a climate action plan 2050, which, which we just announced October last year and we seek to reduce carbon emissions by half before the year 2035 and also to achieve carbon neutrality before the year 2050. Another key element to decarbonize is the use of financing. And Hong Kong as an international financial center with our well-established financial infrastructure and regulatory regime, we have the first ever issuance of green bonds by the government a few years back and has also doubled our borrowing ceiling of green bonds to over 25 billion US dollars. At the same time, to encourage and to ensure the broader community also buy into the ESG concept, we also have the world's greatest ever retail green bond being launched for the retail segment. And we definitely welcome the ADB and also the member economies 
to take advantage of our established bond issuance platform to issue green bonds in such a way that, as highlighted by many fellow governors, we need to crowd in more private investment and also offer more financing capabilities in that regard. Another deed I would highlight is regarding the, the need to diversify our asset or risk diversification. At this age of geopolitical changes and also financial and capital market volatility, I think there's a need more than ever for us to diversify our risk and also diversify our asset. And just now, our Philippine fellow governor highlighted the case of having samurai bond. And in that regard, we definitely welcome the issuance of renminbi bonds and Hong Kong being an offshore renminbi business hub with over 75% of the global offshore FX transactions involving renminbi taking place in Hong Kong. We are more than happy to facilitate that. And finally, the other thing that I would highlight is the need to digitalize, digitization. In that regard, I definitely commend President Massa's efforts to undertake an organizational review because sometimes, as all of you know, similar to many things in life, it is more difficult to change ourselves than to change others. So we have to start with changing ourselves. And in that regard, Hong Kong right now, we boast more than 600 fintech companies and offering technical solutions ranging from green tech, wealth tech, and reg tech. And all these ranging from AI and data analysis definitely can offer solutions digitally to enhance the overall effectiveness of ADB. So looking ahead, the pandemic, climate change, and geopolitical tension will continue to affect economies in the region. And with that regard, Hong Kong is always there with our unique connectivity with Chinese mainland, the Asia Pacific region, and the world to contribute and support ADB in achieving a prosperous, inclusive, and also sustainable environment. And in that regard, definitely, we can join hands together and also use our feet to walk on this pathway for more success to come. Thank you. I thank the governor for Hong Kong, China. I now call on the governor for Portugal to make his intervention. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in my first meeting uh, at the ADB, I would like to start by thanking uh, the Philippine government uh, and the city of Manila for their very warm welcome to us. The world has changed in the last two and a half years as a result of and in response to multiple and cumulative shocks and crises that hit the economy and affect lives. In Asia, the economic recovery faced many challenges and has led to a review and decrease in the outlook growth of forecast development. Bearing in mind the need for uh, a resilient post-COVID-19 recovery, the adverse change challenges in the global economy environment and the negative impacts caused by the illegal and unprovoked aggression by Russia Federation into the Ukraine, which we strongly condemn, uh, and like many others, we urge the ADB to remain responsible and responsive to development member uh, countries' needs and keeping in mind the need to remain committed to the bank objectives and mandates and not deviate from the goals established under the strategy of 2030, and the importance of maintaining the financing soundness of the bank and the robust capa uh, cap capital adequacy framework safeguarding the bank uh, AAA rating. We recognize uh, that there are, has been increased demand for emergency and budget support, particularly in the context of high capitalization utilization and declining of lending he headrooms. This calls for budgetary discipline and robust risk management governance. In this context, context we look forward to the discussion on the revision of the capital adequate framework, and we hope that the outcome of the revision will include measures such as the sovereign concentration limits and countervailing measures automatically triggering a certain risk thresholds. As mentioned by every uh, governor, and in particular uh, uh, the governor from Pakistan, we appreciate the ADB's work on climate change and we urge the entire organization to remain committed to the objective of providing a total of $35 billion for climate change mitigation and adaptation by 2024. We cannot overstate the importance of coordination with other development partners, whether in co-finance 
the resilience and support beneficiary countries in their energy transition process or in strategy discussions regarding best practices in capital adequacy and risk management. I would also like to, to highlight the result of the second annual report on gender diversity at the ADB board. ADB continues to lag behind in peer in terms of female representation at the board of directors. While the bank promotes an agenda of gender equality in all its operations, it is important that we also keep gender diversity in the board as a priority. Finally, I would welcome the recent, recent launching of the new country partnership strategy for Timor-Leste. Uh, it is an important contribution uh, to the accession process of East Timor to WTO and, ASEA, uh, and ASEAN, which I hope will be successful complete in the very near future. Timor-Leste is a value partner in advancing multilateral and regional agendas such as climate change, human rights, and regional peace and stability. Promoting the integration of Timor-Leste in multilateral structures is a key step to accelerating economic development and the diversification of the economy of the region. Thank you so much. I thank the governor for Portugal. I understand that the governor for Finland will deliver joint remarks on behalf of the four Nordic member countries of ADB. I now call on the governor for Finland to deliver the remarks. Thank you, Chair. Um, on behalf of the Nordic countries, uh, Denmark, Finland, Norway and Sweden, I want to thank uh, the government of, of the Philippines and the ADB for organizing this annual meeting. We commend the ADB for the swift COVID-19 response. APVAX has saved many lives since we last met in Fiji. Turning to current and future challenges and opportunities, I want to start by highlighting two green and innovative ADB projects. The Darmin Floating Solar Power Plant and the Lotus Wind Power Project, both in Vietnam, not only diversify the country's energy mix with low carbon renewables, they are also examples of innovative private sector financial solutions that made the projects bankable. We need many more such projects to assist Asian countries leapfrog polluting energy sources to modern competitive and green alternatives, to create sustainable jobs and growth, and to mobilize private capital to green transition. While countries still struggle with the pandemic, the world is now faced with new challenges caused by Russia's unprovoked and unjustified invasion of Ukraine. Increasing inflation globally has been amplified by increasing food and energy prices. Developing economies with high debt and climate vulnerabilities have been hit particularly hard as they continue to face the structural and interrelated challenges of poverty and social, economic and environmental crisis. ADB and ADF at most value with a long-term strategic approach that is also flexible enough to respond rapidly to changing needs of its developing members. When short-term crisis response is needed, it must be well coordinated with other key stakeholders. We look forward to the ADB to help protect people living in poverty and in fragile situations. In Sri Lanka, we welcome the ADB's timely plan to support food security and livelihood. In Pakistan, the bank's support is essential for helping flood-affected communities. The situation in Afghanistan is deeply concerning. The international community should continue to support the people of Afghanistan without financing or legitimizing the Taliban. We must stand firm in our support to peace, democracy and human rights, including the full enjoyment of such rights for women and girls. On Myanmar, we urge the bank to ensure that no ADB engagements, directly or indirectly, finance or contribute to legitimizing the military junta. Let me turn to our joint Nordic priorities for the ADB, development impact and poverty focus, climate and environment, and gender. Firstly, the ADB should continuously work to strengthen development effectiveness which, more than anything, requires country-owned structural reforms that address poverty. Secondly, climate mitigation, adaptation and resilience should have top priority. 
We commend the ADB for its climate ambitions, which must now be turned into reality. Um, climate change affects the poor and vulnerable disproportionately, and this should be noted. $100 billion in ADB's climate finance up to 2013 should be implemented in full and small island developing states prioritized. We encourage further progress on Paris alignment and full integration of climate resilience in all operations. As importantly, ADB must address the joint climate and nature crisis by promoting sustainable food production, transition to green energy, and protecting biodiversity and ecosystems at land and sea. Thirdly, gender equality requires accelerated and cross-cutting action. Gender equality is not only about equal distribution between men and women, but also about the qualitative aspects, ensuring that the knowledge and experience of both men and women are used to promote progress. We look forward to the ADB establishing itself as a true gender equal organization by hiring, promoting and retaining more women in international recruited and management positions. Strong multilateral cooperation is needed to steer the continent through the current rough global waters. The bank must manage its resources well and protect its financial situation and rating. We call for innovative ways of boosting the bank's lending capacity and development impact. Optimizing the use of banks' um, uh, existing capital will help catalyze additional public and private resources that are needed to achieve a prosperous, inclusive, resilient and sustainable Asia and the Pacific. We remain committed in this. Thank you. I thank the governor for Finland. I now call on the governor for Switzerland to make his intervention. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, dear fellow governors, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Switzerland, I would like to thank the Asian Development Bank for hosting this annual meeting, for the excellent organization and the warm hospitality. The past year has presented ADB member countries with too many challenges. The consequences of the pandemic, the food and energy crisis resulting from the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and the impact of climate change affect the lives of millions in the Asia and Pacific region, as demonstrated just now by the devastating floods in Pakistan. We send our condolences and support for overcoming the plight uh, in Pakistan, uh, Pakistan is going through. In light of the open-ended nature of the, of the ongoing crisis, we urge ADB to switch gears from short-term crisis response to longer-term investments. These investments must be aligned with the Paris Agreement and contribute to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. ADB must foster long-term resilience in the infrastructure sector with innovative projects that build on ADB's competitive advantages in line with its strategy 2030. We do expect ADB to deliver on its ambitious climate finance targets, targets of 100 billion US dollars until 2030, and so become the region's climate bank, while continuing to tackle poverty and inequality in the Asian Pacific region. We call on ADB to speed up delivering on these targets including by mobilizing the private sector. This needs to be underpinned by a restrictive perspective to financing fossil fuel projects. Sound financial management must remain at the heart of ADB's development response. We are concerned about ADB's worsening capital utilization ratio and rapidly decreasing lending headroom. We urge ADB to take a proactive approach to risk management. ADB should explore options to optimize its capital base. We welcome ADB's comprehensive review of its safeguard policy. We call on ADB to continue its efforts to eliminate forced labor risks in critical supply chains. We encourage ADB to embed climate 
and to systematically integrate digital privacy and regulatory risk elements in the updated safeguard policy. Ladies and gentlemen, the current challenges call for a renewed effort to make MDBs work better as a system. ADB must closely work with other partners and address development challenges in a coordinated manner. ADB can always count on Switzerland's support in building long-term resilience and development for the benefit of the people of the Asia and Pacific region. We look forward to the continued close cooperation with the ADB. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the Governor for Switzerland. I now call on the Governor for Ireland to make his intervention. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, dear fellow Governors, Honourable Board of Directors, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I would like to thank the Government um, of, the, of the Philippines for hosting this 55th annual meeting and the warm hospitality given to us. I would also like to commend Pre President Asakawa and the management and staff of the bank on the very professional organisation of the event, ensuring that these meetings take place in person for the first time since 2019. For those of us who have attended ADB meetings previously, this excellence uh, should not be a surprise, but it is always appreciated. In thanking our hosts, we also, we also recall the circumstances which led to this event being held in Manila, and we express our best wishes to Sri Lanka and its people as they endeavour to recover from the current challenges. Looking forward as the bank navigates the delivery of its challenging agenda, it will be buffeted by numerous certain unhead, uh, uncertain headwinds in the future year. COVID-19 impacts persist, particularly affecting the most vulnerable, who are also most at risk from the collateral effects of the illegal and unjust invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Price inflation, including rise in energy and commodity prices, threaten food security, which will worsen poverty, while climate change remains as a persistent and profound challenge. These overlapping crises and the perennial challenge of debt and debt sustainability have regrettably compounded and eroded progress in education and gender equality. It is clear that these challenges necessitate a multilateral and coordinated response. As a critical, important regional development stakeholder, the bank must be capable and, commitment, and committed to be at the vanguard of this response. To achieve this position, there are some areas which require the bank's focus. We, like others, are concerned about the declining headroom and the risk of, that the capital utilisation ratio might reach the alarm zone in the near future. It is imperative that the bank manages capital in line with best practice while protecting its rating and optimising its use of its resources. It must draw upon exemplars from other multinational development banks and draw upon the recommendations from the G20 independent review of NDP capital adequacy frameworks. It is only by achieving this outcome that the bank can successfully stretch to meet the increased demands for budgetary and emergency support from borrowers, while also achieving its ambitious climate finance targets. As the bank successfully pivoted to combat the impact of COVID-19 on regional member countries, it now must prioritise and strongly commit to address climate change. This continues to undermine progress towards, towards the SDGs and exacerbates the vulnerability of the uh, least developed countries. This is not the time to lose our focus uh, for or diminish our climate ambitions. The steps taken to date to align all bank operations with the Paris uh, Agreement are welcome. We also welcome the ambition to be the region's climate bank and the related commitment to deliver 100 billion in climate financing from 2019 to 2030. We strongly support the president's, uh, the president's ambition in this area and we look forward to, to its progression over the, over the coming years. This climate work must be outcomes focused to ensure a meaningful impact to help people adversely uh, affected by climate change across the region by working closely with governments and increasingly the private sector in line with existing commitments. A strong focus on adaptation will be essential in this regard. Extreme weather events like those reg regrettably experienced recently by Pakistan and this week in the Philippines itself are becoming more common and more devastating. This intensifies pressure on food security in the region. We commend the bank for its efforts in this context and for remaining focused on promoting rural development and food security. We wish to assert our commitment to advocating on behalf of small island developing states who are highly vulnerable due to compounding pressures of climate change, food security, high debt distress, as well as trade deficits in food and energy. We are proud to host a single donor trust fund in the bank, which addresses these issues within an overall climate resilience and risk management perspective. SIDS and fragile and conflict-afflicted situations must be central to the replenishment of the ADF, which starts next year. We commend the work undertaken by the bank in accelerating progress in gender equality, and all, which is also core to our own development policy. 
We strongly urge her to continue efforts in this area and advocate a move towards more gender equity within the bank itself. The bank's organisation review presents a good opportunity to streamline and fine-tune its structures and to gold-plate its governance. This will be an important foundation if the bank is to achieve its strategy 2030 vision of a prosperous, inclusive, resilient and sustainable Asia and Pacific. The challenges we face are many, but it is only through multilateralism and collaboration that they can be overcome. In line with Ireland's development objective of, of reaching the furthest behind first, the Bank must address the linkage between climate change, food security, conflict and development. This, necess this necessitates working across the humanitarian, development and peace nexus. The Bank's role in fostering growth and cooperation in the region will be central to the future prosperity of its inhabitants. Ireland looks forward to continuing partnership in the years ahead and working with the Bank and other members to achieve the greatest impacts for those who are furthest behind. Thank you, Chairman. I thank the Governor for Ireland and I call upon the Governor for Bangladesh. Thank you. Uh, the Governor is not here, so I am the alternative Governor representing him. Honourable Chair, distinguished Governors, President ADB, dear colleagues, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all. At the outset, I'd like to convey my sincere appreciation to ADB for organizing this meeting. We also express our gratitude to the government of Philippines for hosting this event. At this occasion, I'd like to take this opportunity to express our heartfelt thanks to the President Asakawa for his proactive role in supporting the member states, including Bangladesh, during the COVID-19 pandemic with additional financing. Your commitment at this forum to continue the support is really encouraging for us. Distinguished audience, echoing with the chair, I also like to reiterate that global community is now passing through an uncertainty due to the ongoing geopolitical turmoil. Food, fuel, fertilizer, and financial crisis have been disrupting the global supply chain, resulted volatile currency reserves, and increasing the general price level across the world. This has, however, been disproportionately affecting the livelihood of the poorest segment of the global community. At this critical juncture, we urge ADB to come up with generous supports. I critically mention ADB's intervention in the following areas. Support for economic recovery and social resilience, graduation from the LDC status, ensuring food security, improving quality of education and health services, and promoting clean energy. Excellencies, climate change has been severely impacting the lives and livelihood of the poor and vulnerable people of the world, including Bangladesh, although we are merely responsible for this current situation. At this stage, ADB should come up with cost-effective financing for adaptation, mitigation, and disaster risk reduction. I also urge ADB to, to revisit the existing financing modalities and request to extend funds, finance to policy-based credit or budget support rather than strictly adhering, adhering to the project-based financing which involves lengthy disbursement process. Concessional financing rather than blended financing would be more realistic approach in addressing the vulnerability of the climate change and also allow debt for climate swap in relevant cases. Excellencies, at this critical global environment, we need better coherence, be more proactive, strong partnership, sharing knowledge and technologies among ourselves than we did before. We believe together we can ensure prosperous and inclusive development and build a green and sustainable world for our future generation. I thank you all. I thank the governor for Bangladesh and call upon the governor for Netherlands. Thank you, Chair. Chairman, President Asakawa, distinguished governors and delegates, ladies and gentlemen, 
On behalf of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, I want to express our gratitude to the government of the Philippines for hosting the 55th annual meeting of the Asian Development Bank. This is the moment when we all come together to show our commitment to the bank, our appreciation to all the hardworking A to B staff and management who have kept the ship on course during the pandemic, and to discuss ways to navigate through the rough seas we find ourselves in. I also take this opportunity to express my heartfelt sympathy for the people and government of Pakistan suffering the impact of the floods, a natural disaster which we in our low-lying country are very familiar with. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, many of my colleagues have already alluded to the various challenges faced by developing member countries. These challenges have an impact on the bank as well. In order for the bank to maintain its position as the preferred partner for regional countries, we have to make changes in three vital areas. First of all, we need to transform the Asian Development Bank into the region's climate bank. We thank President Asakabo for expressing his ambition, which we fully support. An ambition that is accompanied by the goals to achieve full Paris alignment by 2023 and 100 billion US dollars in climate finance by 2030 from the bank's own resources. In these difficult times, this is a target that will not be easy to meet, but it will be essential for the future of developing member countries and of the world at large. We ask the President to pay particular attention to the nexus of climate, food security and water management. <coughs> Secondly, big ambitions require big financial means. It is therefore more imperative than ever to manage the bank's capital in line with best practices while protecting its rating and optimizing the use of its resources. The combination of declining lending headroom and the risk that the capital utilization ratio reach the alarm zones in the near future is worrying. We expect ADB to update its capital adequacy framework, including high quality risk governance reform to proactively and efficiently manage capital, such as sovereign concentration limits and packages of predefined uh, countervailing measures some of which will, would automatically be triggered at certain risk thresholds. Finally, an organization that supports countries to be re resilient should be resilient itself. The new organizational review provides an opportunity to prepare, prepare the bank for the decades to come and critically review structures that have been in place for many years. However, we should keep in mind that change is not the goal here, but rather a means to improving the impact that the bank achieves on the ground. In this respect, we urge managed to fully mainstream climate through the entire new organizational setup. With these three essential changes, we can work together towards a bank that is fit for the future. The Netherlands looks forward to remaining an engaged partner of the bank and of our partner countries in the Asia Pacific. Thank you. I thank the governor for Netherlands. Governors, we will be having a five minute break.
governors, if you could take your seats so we could continue the session. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, you may resume the session. Governors, thank you for returning to your seats. I now call on the governor for Mongolia. Thank you, Chairman, Your Excellency Governors, President Massa, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. A very good afternoon to all of you. It's my great pleasure to be here to participate in the 55th Annual Meeting of Board of Governors of the Asian Development Bank. First of all, I would like to extend our gratitude to the Government of Philippines for the warm welcome and hospitality. Also, on behalf of the Government of Mongolia, I would like to express our deep appreciation for the ADB, for the proactive and timely support since the start of pandemic through vaccine financing, fiscal support, technical assistance, and other interventions. Recovery has been slow as we face multitude of crises and disaster never seen before. COVID pandemic followed by geopolitical issues, climate change related events, energy and food insecurities, have put greater strain on our economies. If, this, if the situation continues without sound intervention, the consequences will be dire and have long-term impacts on the regional economies as we continue to struggle to recover from the pandemic and build resilience. The most vulnerable groups will be hit the hardest and many are at the risk to go into poverty. We believe as we take on the many challenges ahead of us, ADB will continue to play an integral role, integral role and take necessary measures to support us in the most efficient and effective manner. Taking this, this opportunity, I would like to share with you the Mongolia's post-pandemic recovery and current economic challenges. The accommodative policy mix and the strong nationwide vaccination helped to support employment and investment and generate revenues through business activity, supporting economic recovery. Nevertheless, Mongolia's economy is still on its way to recovery from the downturn caused by pandemic with 1.6% growth in 2021 and expected to grow by 25 to 3% in this year. Now Mongolia's, Mongolia is facing further challenges due to today's global situation. As you all know, the Mongolia is landlocked country in Central Asia between two large neighbors China and Russia, and therefore the inflationary pressures caused by supply chain shocks are amplified. More than half of the inflation dynamics are explained by increases in price of imported goods, and the recent surge in oil prices is also adding to the inflationary pressures. On the external front, the balance of payments deficit widened substantially to 1.3 billion USD in the first seven months of, of the, this year. The economy has not benefited much from higher commodity prices owing to the limited export volumes under the COVID related restric restrictions. On the, other hand, on the other hand, high prices of food and fuel, increased transportation costs, 
social welfare support, such as child money program, and the economic recovery have pushed imports up, leading to larger deficit in the trade balance. To conclude, the policy space is increasingly constrained after, after two years of accommodative monetary and fiscal policies, yet persisting instability and risks call for adjustment in macroeconomic policies. We hope ADB, will support, ADB support will be crucial in overcoming these challenges. Thank you very much. I thank the governor for Mongolia and call upon the governor for Timor Leste. Thank you, Chair. Excellency Mr. Asakawa, honorable governors, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for hosting this year's annual meeting. Most DMCs like Timor Leste have by now declared victory over COVID-19. The vaccines arrived in time to allow vulnerable DMCs like Timor-Leste meet their obligations by providing better protection to their citizens and ensure the provision of basic services. We are grateful to have benefited from ADB's COVID-19 response plan. And over the years, our country has been given access to ADB's grants, technical support, and concessional loans. Timor-Leste was able to reopen its borders in March resume economic activities, and boost confidence. The twin shocks of COVID-19 and massive floods slowed economic recovery, but non-oil GDP is estimated to have grown at 2.9% in 2021, after a negative growth of 8.3% in 2020. In 2022, the non-oil GDP is expected to grow 3.3% as a result of increased public spending and a steady progress with vaccination. Now with supply chain disruptions and widespread inflation resulting from Russia's invasion of Ukraine may again expose vulnerable countries to greater risks. So we need to act collectively to address the remaining challenges. And the strong and wise leadership of President Massa, I trust that ADB will continue to assist its DMCs in making their cities livable and resilient to climate change. And for that to happen, more resources are required. In fact, Timor Leste's access to climate financing in terms of the amount of funding approved to GDP is one of the lowest in Asia and Pacific region. In the long run, Timor Leste will have to develop an economy that is less dependent on petroleum revenues, an economy that puts people at the center with significant improvements in productivity, along with the infrastructure that is climate proof. An economy that is integrated in the region. I would like to thank Portugal for eluding ADB's support to Timor Leste's accession to ASEAN membership. Today, Timor Leste is closer than ever in joining the ASEAN membership, and this is a clear outcome of the dedicated technical assistance provided by ADB resident mission in Dili and the various departments here at the headquarters. By becoming the 11th member of the ASEAN will help Timor Leste seize the opportunities of renewed globalization and develop to its full capacity. Timor Leste looks forward to a stronger partnership with ADB. Thank you, sir. I thank the governor for Timor Leste and call upon the governor for Cook Islands. Thank you, Chair. President Asakawa and Honorable Governors Kiarana. It is my pleasure to be here in person for this 55th annual meeting of the Board of Governors of the Asian Development Bank. The fact that many of us are present here in person indicates that we are resilient and ready to tackle the challenges ahead. The devastating socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 on the global economy have caused deep economic downturns for many countries, more so for small island developing states and especially those who rely on tourism receipts, like the Cook Islands. With the shutdown of international travel due to the COVID-19 pandemic, our economy contracted by over one-fifth, even while we injected over 26% of GDP in support and stimulus. Tourism receipts dropped from 61.4% of GDP in 2019 
to a little, to a little over 4% in the financial year 2021. These decline are the largest in the Cook Islands history and among the largest among ADB's DMCs. The Cook Islands status is a small island developing state and nano state place us in an extreme level of economic exposure to disasters triggered by natural assets which are increasing in intensity and frequency. The erosion of macroeconomic and fiscal buffers due to the COVID-19 pandemic have limited the Cook Islands' ability to respond to future adverse events without further undermining debt sustainability. We operate within a global development landscape which has changed significantly since COVID-19. As small island developing states and nano states, we face a unique set of vulnerabilities which impede our ability to achieve sustainable development. We would like ADB to be more cognizant of the United Nations Multidimensional Vulnerabilities Index and give us clarity on how it will be applied to a differentiated approach to Pacific developing member countries. The Cook Islands continue to face challenges in accessing grants and concessional financing as a result of our graduation from official development assistance. Not only are we a small island developing state, we are also a nano state with a population of less than 50,000. As a small island nano state, our challenges are exacerbated by the fact that we are not able to mount strong fiscal responses on our own. We would like to see how ADB will respond to first the G20 SDG stimulus package which aims to inject over 500 billion per year by 2025 through NDBs to achieve SDGs. Second, the enhanced debt service suspension initiative to refinance the bilateral debts of developing countries that fall due during 2023 to 2025, enhancing the DSSI to include middle income countries and encourage debt relief such as debt for STD swaps. The Cook Islands sits with a long and unique rela regional relationship with our Pacific Island neighbors. However, since we are not members of either the World Bank or International Monetary Fund, our key economic data is not captured in regional data spreadsheets, which hinders the framing of regional programs, reviews, and assessments. The Cook Islands is not a recipient of regular surveillance through the likes of the Article 4 macroeconomic assessment and technical assistance support from IMF, other than that provided by PIFTAC, which strengthens data quality. Past efforts for membership have failed. We will be renewing our membership application in view of the crisis as the benefits provided from membership will support our own efforts to recover. We ask fellow ADB member countries and ADB to support our membership bid. Mr. President, I would like to acknowledge the support provided by ADB to the Cook Islands through the provision of COVID-19 emergency supplies, contingency disaster financing, Asia-Pacific Disaster Response Fund, COVID-19 Pandemic Response Option, technical assistance, and the Japan Fund for Poverty Reduction Grant in dealing with urgent economic, financial, and public health pressures. The Cook Islands government is also appreciative of the work by ADB towards the reclassification of the Cook Islands from Group C to Group B under ADB's graduation policy. Mr. President, it has been a challenging two and a half years for the Cook Islands and our Pacific neighbors, and we appreciate the extraordinary support from ADB. We trust that the ADB will continue to support its DMCs as we recover and continue to offer innovative solutions to address the challenges we face. We look forward to a continued partnership with ADB as we will build back better. Thank you. I thank the Governor for Cook Islands and call upon the Governor for Belgium. Your Excellency Chairman of the Board of Governors, fellow Governors, President of the Asian Development Bank. I would like to express our appreciation to the Governor of the Philippines for the flexibility shown in making this year's annual meeting possible in Manila. The war against Ukraine comes at a time when developing countries are still struggling to recover from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is also threatening to derail the development progress 
made by DMCs pushing the 2030 SDGs and the aspirations of ADB's 2030 strategy further out of reach. On climate change, we recognize the efforts undertaken by the bank. However, global efforts to deal with the climate emergency are severely impacted by the war against Ukraine. Therefore, and more than ever, Belgium encourages ADB to support its DMC countries to address their energy and food security concerns by accelerating the adoption of renewables and the strengthening the fight against climate change, also echoing the urgent call from Pakistan. Further, Belgium would like to express its appreciation to the bank's staff who continue their hard work against an unusual challenging background. We would like to encourage ADB to attract highly skilled human capital with a special focus on improving gender diversity at management levels and within the board of directors. More than ever, it is essential for the international community to collaborate closely. Special attention must go to preserving debt sustainability. The impact of the war could push more DMCs into serious debt distress. We recognize that there is an increasing demand for budget and emergency support from borrowers. All these challenges put pressure on MDB's finances. The combination of declining lending headroom and the risk that the capital utilization ratio will reach the alarm zones in the near future is extremely worrying. The importance of the G20's ongoing work rego regarding the independent review of MDB's capital adequacy frameworks needs to be underlined. We expect the ADB to implement the recommendations coming from this report as soon as possible and make more efficient use of and maximizing its financial resources. We encourage the bank to update its CAF including high quality risk governance reforms to proactively and efficiently manage capital. In conclusion, we would like to commend President Asakawa's leadership during this ongoing crisis and encourage him and ADB to continue being a strategic partner in the Asian and Pacific region by supporting countries to address and mitigate the consequences of the ongoing global crisis while sustaining its efforts to er eradicate extreme poverty. Thank you for your attention. I thank the governor for Belgium and call upon the governor for Georgia. Um, thank you. Esteemed President, Honorable Chairman and Governors, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to represent Georgia on behalf of the Governor, Minister Khotishvili, by participating in the 55th Annual Meeting of the Asian Development Bank, and grateful to ADB team for organizing this hybrid event in such difficult circumstances. Such meetings provide a good opportunity to discuss important aspects of development cooperation as we continue to recover from COVID-19 pandemic while addressing unprecedented geopolitical challenges globally and regionally in the still making of the efforts to promote sustainable development. ADB has proudly showcased itself throughout the history of its existence as an institution that is truly responsive to the development needs of its member states. ADB's commitment for achieving a prosperous, inclusive and resilient Asia and Pacific has been manifesting in very tangible results. A two-year COVID-19 pandemic followed by the war in Ukraine as a result of the Russian invasion has been causing irrevocable damage, first of all to the Ukrainian people, the country's economy, and more broadly it has led to the greatest negative shock to the global economy. Georgia, having the first-hand experience of still ongoing Russian occupation, has been constantly dealing with damaging effects of all sorts of crises emerging regionally or globally. Despite the V-shaped recovery in 2021, the uh, start of the 2022 was also promising. The new ge geopolitical turmoil that emerged in the region threatened the outlook of 2022 and added uncertainty to the medium-term stance. Some changing circumstances and shifted transit corridors coupled with the uh, recovery from COVID-19 
has somewhat overcompensated negative impacts of the war for the time being and put Georgia on higher than originally estimated growth path and allowed smoother fiscal consolidation, but medium-term outlook obviously maintains a lot of downside risks. Two-digit inflation uh, still remains a challenge and a burden for the citizens of Georgia as well as worldwide, especially on food and energy prices. Georgia continues its successful cooperation with the bank to address significant challenges. With ADB support through diversified portfolio in Georgia in public and private sectors, we are committed to continue delivering on key reform areas. Energy security and energy independence has proven to be a priority, and Georgia, with its potential to increase further its green renewable power generation and the potential upcoming con connectivity under Sea cable, electricity cable between Georgia and uh, Europe, trusts on ADBs and other IFIs support in this direction. Reforming corporate governance, investing in connectivity and infrastructure development further, and human capital, among others, while enhancing energy efficiency, food security, and social protection for the most vulnerable in a fiscally sustainable man manner does make the medium-term policy planning a challenge, which can only be addressed through the synergy of cooperation. Let me thank you again, the ADB team and the government of Philippines. I wish all of you and our cooperation a great future and peaceful free world and want to believe that we will have a lot to proudly share with one another about the outcomes of the current anti-crisis measures when we have honor to meet you in Tbilisi, Georgia in 2024 annual meetings. Thank you. I thank the government for Georgia and call upon the governor for Spain. Thank you. Mr. Chairman of the Board of Governors, President Asakawa, Honorable Governors, Representative of Member States, ladies and gentlemen. At our last online annual meeting, we hope that the pandemic soon be a bad memory. Now, beyond the long-term effects of the pandemic, we face a challenging global macroeconomic environment, widespread food insecurity, and the spillovers from the Russian invasion of Ukraine. All these events are magnified by the climate crisis which terrible effects, like the floods in Pakistan, we are witnessing. In this regard, allow me to show our support to Pakistan. After a swift reaction, the bank has continued to support DMCs, stepping up its lending with a renewed countercyclical support facility and additional policy-based loans. However, beyond lending levels, the quality of interventions and development impact are of paramount importance. In the medium term, we believe that the use of these modalities should be moderate for a greater use of investment loans. Simultaneously, attention should be given to close coordination with other IFIs, while avoiding building up unsustainable debt levels. Moving forward, the bank will need to prioritize, focus on development impact, further enhance its role as a knowledge solution provider, and bring in other co-financers, traditional and new. Urban development is an area of special importance. Among other aspects, health, planning, water and waste treatment, and water supply are involved, all with a broad climate change perspective. The bank has a strong record in this field and the necessary skills to improve the quality of life of millions of people in this area. On climate, let me congratulate the bank on its announced Paris alignment commitments, as well as on the $100 billion climate finance target for 2030. To reach it, the bank will need to continue building its pipeline on climate adaptation and mitigation. In this area, coordination with other MDBs and international institutions is compulsory, since climate is the exemplary global public good. Given the challenges we face, uh, we face the demand for support will most likely remain high in the near future. However, declining lending headroom and the negative evolution of the capital utilization rate is extremely worrying. Considering the recommendations from the G20 independent review of NDB's capital adequacy framework, drawing from the best practices of other NDBs and in close coordination with them, we expect ADB to update its framework and manage its capital in line with best practices, including high quality risk governance reforms. A more differentiated pricing policy will also help the bank in positioning itself as a knowledge institution. Even if reducing costs should not be the focus, all action should be done in the best cost-efficient way. This principle should be pivotal, driving the organizational review. 
If we manage to be even more efficient, extra resources could be allocated for DMCs. Diversity makes organization better. Therefore, we welcome the work done by the bank, both internally at the board and externally in this regard. Let me finish by thanking on behalf of Spain, both ADB and the government of the Philippines for making this meeting possible. It is wonderful to be able to meet in person again, and thank you also to all ADB staff and the board of directors for their work during the past months. I thank the governor for Spain and call upon the governor for Taipei, China. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, honorable governors. I would like to thank the government of Philippines and the Asian Development Bank for their excellent preparations and, and hospitality. The 55th annual meeting is taking place at a point which had once again proven that the importance of solidarity in the fight against the COVID-19. I firmly agree with, the, with what President Asakawa has said. Addressing the impacts of the pandemic and supporting long-term development are not mutually ex exclusive. This is evident through, the, through, through not only the ADC, ADB's effort to support member countries in recovering from the pandemic, but also is continuously, continuously working with member countries on the long-term projects such as sustainable development in the region. I believe our response to COVID-19 has established the foundation for an inclusive, resilient, and green recovery, ensuring, ensuring progress toward the strategy 2030 objectives of the bank. As the governor of the bank, I would like to encourage the bank to continue making best use of various existing tools to support its member country and the region. I would also like to share our experience with you in the, the, in the aspect of Green Finance Action Plan 2 launched in 2020. The purpose of the, this plan is to guide the financial market in addressing potential climate-related risks, capitalizing associate, with associate opportunities, and the rising awareness of our business and investors regarding environmental, social, and corporate governance through financial mechanisms. Lastly, I would, like to, I would also like to reiterate that my country is a founding member of the Asian Development Bank and a reliable partner. The wrong nomen nomenclature, Taipei China, which was unilaterally adopted by the bank, has hindered us from making further contribution to the bank's mission. We call on all members to treat one another equally, fairly, and with respect. To conclude, ADB had played a pivotal role in helping member countries transform their development landscape all this year. I wish all member countries continued success in their quest for development, peace, and prosperity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the governor for Taipei, China. Fellow governors, I would like to clarify for the record that ADB recognizes the member only by the name of Taipei, China. Now I call upon the governor for governors representing the Pacific developing member countries. Thank you, Chair. It's my honor to present the statement on behalf of the Pacific Developing Countries to you today. 
on behalf of the governors from the Cook Islands, Federated State of Micronesia, Fiji, Kiribati, Marshall Islands, Nauru, Niue, Papua New Guinea, Palau, Samoa, Samoa uh, Solomon Islands, Tonga, Tuvalu, and Vanuatu. President Azakawa, fellow governors, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the governors of the Pacific member countries, I extend our warmest Pacific greetings. I also would like to echo statements uh, of my colleagues of appreciation to our host, the Republic of the Philippines, and thank the Asian Development Bank for helping us to have a very good meeting this year in person. It's a pleasure, a great pleasure, to be here in person for the 55th ADB Board of Governors annual meeting. Mr. President, I convey our most sincere gratitude to the ADB for its swift response and support at the onset of the pandemic. This demonstrated the agility of ADB as a trusted partner, not just in times of crisis, but also in tackling persistent development challenges facing DMCs, especially small island development states. The indicators in the recent Asian Development Outlook are clear that we, the Pacific SIDS, were the hardest hit from the pandemic, and we are projected to be the last to recover. Based on this, we encourage ADB to continue to support the Pacific SIDS in our efforts for recovery and growth through progressing key reforms and investments. Having said that, we must not lose sight that climate change remains the single greatest threat to the livelihoods, security, and well-being of the peoples of the Blue Pacific and across developing member countries. We welcome the Pacific Approach 2021 to 2025 that will guide ADB to deliver new ways of working in the Pacific, including capitalizing on regional cooperation and integration, enhancing food security, and providing greater recognition of the many diverse challenges facing Pacific Island members. As, as custodians of vast ocean resources, healthy oceans are central to the well-being and livelihood of Pacific Island states. We welcome the Ocean Health Action Plan and welcome its timely implementation and request regular progress reports to Pacific governors through our constituency office. Given the challenges and uncertainties that the Pacific region continues to face, and recalling obligations stated in ADB's charter to give special regard to its smaller members, we, the Pacific members, reiterate the following to be considered as raised with you yesterday. First, supporting develop, developing member countries to achieve ambitious climate targets. We call on ADB to support the achievement of ambitious nationally determined contributions of its developing member countries, in particular the large DMCs in the region, and ensure a clear pathway to limiting global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. The Pacific SIDS had a very minimal carbon footprint globally, but have faced existential threats to climate events. So we welcome ADB's increased climate finance ambition to 100 billion by 2030 and call on ADB to support Pacific SIDS to ensure the impact of the increased ambitions translates to increased climate adaptation projects that are critical to our survival. Second, leveraging further the investments in digital connect <coughs> excuse me, connectivity. The ADB has been an important partner in reducing the remoteness of the Pacific through recent ICT investments, but we could call on we would call on ADB to do more to support even greater digital transformation to support education, health, business, financial services, and social development. Third, unlocking private sector development. There are enormous challenges in the Pacific in attracting private sector finance due to structural barriers, including this economies of scale, remoteness, and a high-risk investment environment access to cheaper capital and the difficulty of corresponding uh, banking remains a constraint to private sector development. The new ADF 13 private sector window offers a valuable opportunity for non-sovereign operations in the Pacific, but the progress is not as fast as we expect or hope. We urge ADB to do more in the sovereign or non-sovereign space in the Pacific, especially in the service sector and productive sectors such as fisheries, agriculture, and we encourage value additions. These are critical areas of our existence and one that also supports food security. Fourth, ensuring that ADB safeguard policies are relevant and responsive to the Pacific context. 
We understand that ADB has begun a process to modernize its safeguards policy statement, and it will be important that the unique environmental and safeguard circumstances of the Pacific Island countries are given due regard, including institutional capacities, the unique and differing customary land tenure practices, and environmental fragility. Fifth, continuing to support capacity development and supplementation in Pacific operations. Given the endorsement of the Pacific Approach 2021 to 2025, we call for focused attention to be given to addressing thin capacities on the ground among Pacific members to resourcing by ADB internally and in Pacific member countries to support Pacific operations and urge that the design of future programs benefit from lessons of previous operations. We welcome the progress of increasing ADB country offices, but we would like to see more decision-making roles delegated to country and sub-regional offices, together with more technical experts to provide ground-level support for effective implementation of country portfolios and more capacity development initiatives to address the incapacity issues. Six, given the global rise in the price of goods and services, which are likely to increase cost of existing and post-COVID projects, we call on ADB to consider ways to ensure the real value of concessional financing and assistance are maintained and not eroded from inflationary pressures today. Seven, access to concessional resources. We strongly encourage ADB to consider extending more concessional resources for highly vulnerable small states that are currently eligible only for OCR lending, such as thematic support to country-specific vulnerabilities. The use of gross national income per capita index has precluded some of the most vulnerable small islands from full access to concessional resources. Given the inherent vulnerability faced by SIDS, we call on ADB to explore options that can qualify SIDS to access to the much needed concessional resources for development. Finally, promoting diversity and inclusion at ADB, given ADB's membership is regionally diverse, we encourage ADB to ensure that its workforce reflects regional diversity, including Pacific diversity. Mr. President, we trust that this year's annual meeting will involve a commitment from shareholders to support the ADB's leadership role in the Pacific, recognizing unique needs of our small, and, uh, small island economies. Thank you for the additional time. I thank the governor for Palu, and I now call on the governor for Uzbekistan. Governor, let us turn our attention to the screen. Dear Chairman, esteemed governors, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to express my gratitude to the government of the Philippines and the Asian Development Bank for the hosting the annual meeting. Dear President Asakawa, let me express my appreciation for your cooperation and continuous support for economic development of Uzbekistan. We do appreciate the bank's support for bold and comprehensive reforms program of the President of the Republic of Uzbekistan, His Excellency Shavkat Mirziyoyev. ADB is a long-term partner with the largest portfolio in Uzbekistan. Bank's portfolio remains impressive with over 10 billion with 80 projects since 1996. ADB is our trusted partner that provides not only financing but also advises us on various reforms areas through the policy dialogue which is tailored to Uzbekistan needs and conditions. We value the ADB's commitment to determination and to deliver strong results in our country. Dear participants of the annual meeting, Uzbekistan adopted a new five-year development strategy through 2026 which is based on the following pillars, strengthening the role of the civil society, ensuring the rule of law, sustainable and equitable economic growth, just a social policy, acting as a responsible member of the global community, conducting open and pragmatic foreign policy. Many of objectives uh, the Uzbekistan's new strategy corresponds with the ADB's priorities, and we are looking forward to the expansion of our active engagement in the following areas. First, human capital development. We would appreciate ADB's assistance in the health, education, and the skills of development and would welcome the new initiatives aimed at supporting our secondary education system through an improved curriculum in science, technology, engineering, and math. Implementing projects in the skills development for the unemployed and underemployed, modernizing healthcare sector. Second, we are very much interested in tapping on opportunities of the 
of the FI program to foster an environment conducive to women's entrepreneurship. As one of the VFI implementing partners, we appreciate the ADB's support in expansion of financial services and market access for the women-owned or led firms. Third, we are eager to increase the number of PPP projects in the energy and the transport sector, healthcare, education, water supply, sanitation, and heating. Fourth, we hope the ADB will continue increasing the private sector operations in Uzbekistan and expand offshore local currency bonds as a funding solution. Dear ladies and gentlemen, today the world has entered an era of a global transformation that bring both challenges and the new opportunities. And in this regard, it is important to have an open and constructive dialogue between the ADB's member countries to jointly identify new drivers for the growth. We consider that ADB as our strategic partner and will make every effort to further develop our long-term cooperation. Once again, I'd like to express my gratitude to Mr. Asakawa and the ADB's team for support to the Republic of Uzbekistan and country members, and the government of the Philippines for the hosting this important meeting. I wish all participants fruitful work and a great success. Thank you for your attention. I thank the governor for Uzbekistan and call upon the governor for Bhutan. Chair of the Board of Governor, President Mr. Massa, Governor, Alternate Governors, Distinguished Delegates, uh, please allow me uh, to convey a good wishes from His Majesty the King, the Royal Government and the people of Bhutan. It is a pleasure for me and my delegation to be here in person in Manila for the 55th annual meeting of the Board of Governors of the ADB. I would like to thank the Government of Philippines and ADB headquarters for hosting all the delegates from across the globe and for the warm welcome and the hospitality showcased by Manila. I also take this opportunity to express my sincere condolence for Pakistan with the recent flooding event in many parts of Pakistan and our prayers for a speedy recovery from the disaster. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, our world was confronted with a major health crisis and economic disruptions. In, in the last two years, we have lost almost uh, around 15 million lives to the pandemic and with the large scale containment measures, the global economy has plunged into its worst recession since the Great Depression. While Bhutan's economy and the livelihood of its people have been adversely impacted under the far-sighted leadership of His Majesty the King and the concerted efforts played by the government in providing timely and substantive support to the people, businesses, and the adoption of extensive, extensive targeted health measures, we have been exceptionally fortunate to have been protected from some of the most devastating outcomes. The royal, royal government, since the start of the pandemic, have started implementing economic contingency plan in the areas of agriculture production, skills development, and tourism product development. Further, various phases of monetary and fiscal measures were put in place to cushion the key affected groups, and the National Credit Guarantee schemes rolled out as a counter-cyclical measure to ease in access to financing. Under the benevolent leadership of His Majesty the King of Bhutan, we have also rolled out the interest support relief and income support relief to all the businesses and individuals hard hit by the pandemic for the last two and a half years. Excellencies, like any other countries in the world, Bhutan had to strive to make a difficult choice between lives and livelihood amid the pandemic. However, we have only have recorded 21 COVID-related deaths that too with other comorbid conditions and our vaccination coverage at this point in time stands at 99%, including the vaccination for 5 to 11 years of uh, child. President, Chair and Distinguished Delegates, with the easing of COVID-related restrictions in Bhutan, with the support from both bilateral and multilateral development partners, will focus on building a better post-COVID Bhutan. Major transformation is already in progress to ensure that we live up to the fast-changing world full of uncertainties. ADB also has been very instrumental with the kind of support rendered to its member countries during the time of the COVID pandemic and learning a lesson from current crisis, we strongly urge ADB and other MDBs to closely guide smaller economies with the early warning system as we continue to venture into an uncharted destination, that too with the full of uncertainties. 
This will enable the vulnerable countries to put in place the policy measures to mitigate the possible future shocks and will require support to prevent the odd events not to let us experience surprises in the future. As we move forward and position ourselves on a path to economic recovery, we are challenged with a myriad of economic and social challenges. This calls for a green, resilient and inclusive, uh, uh, inclusive development pathways. And as our economy is already challenged with the stringent COVID containment norms, it is now further dampened by the supply chain disruption leading to inflationary pressure and food and energy supply with a downgrading of economic growth prospects uh, in developed and fast developing economies for the next two to three years. We are uncertain as to how our regional economic outlook will likely be. Bhutan is challenged with the widening fiscal deficit, ever-increasing sustained form of inflation, youth unemployment, widening trade deficit, leading to depletion of foreign currency reserves. Hydropower and tourism have been a leading source of domestic revenue, but with the fast-changing weather pattern and looming risk of a global pandemic, Bhutan must seriously pursue our economic diversification. President, Chair and distinguished delegates, time calls for a closer engagement with the development partner and also among the countries, and our challenges are homogeneous in nature, and our collective effort seems to be the only silver bullet to resolve the issues. The pandemic has taught us to be more efficient, hence need to maintain the momentum to act fast, uh, be responsive, and most importantly, to be agile. Uh, in conclusion, I would like to compliment the President Massa for his dynamic leadership and also the uh, and the guiding a ADB uh, towards uh, so many reforms in a short span of time is heartening to note the stellar performance of ADB despite the challenges of the pandemic and the recent global economic fallout. Excellencies, I urge that our kind of words, all our kind of words and diplomacy be translated into a real-time action and I look forward to a more practical, priority-based and focused country partner partnership strategy for Bhutan. I thank you and Tashtile. I thank the governor for Bhutan and call upon the governor for Armenia. Honorable Chair, dear President Asakawa, distinguished governors and delegates, ladies and gentlemen, we finally meet in person for the first time in more than three years to discuss major global and regional challenges. On behalf of Republic of Armenia, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to ADB and the government of Philippines for the warm hospitality. While not yet fully out of COVID crisis, we find ourselves in new ones, with huge risks of global conflicts, disruption of economic value chains, and diminished trust between nations. Armenia was not able to bypass any of those. In the absence of proper condemnation from the international community, Azerbaijan continues the, its policy of aggression, thus endangering human lives and the right of development of people in the region. Two weeks ago, the large-scale aggression against the sovereign territory of the Republic of Armenia, launched by Azerbaijan on the night of September 12-13, 2022, took lives of 207 people, including civilians. Densely populated communities in three regions of the Republic of Armenia were targeted, critical infrastructure was seriously damaged or completely destroyed. More than 7,600 people have been displaced and around 25,000 students and 6,000 kids' right to education have been violated. Azerbaijan completely disregards the mediation efforts by the international community and endangers the initiatives of, to establish peace, stability and cooperation in the South Caucasus, including those initiated by the Asian Development Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenges we are or will be experiencing are unprecedented and we all, including ADB, need rapid transformations to be able to overcome them. We need to change our governance, enhance cooperation mechanisms and improve the business and natural environments to ensure that everyone can participate in and benefit from national and global development. What is the role of ADB in this important process? ADB was founded 56 years ago to combat poverty in Asia and Pacific. This is still a critical goal. What has changed during these 56 years is our understanding of how poverty can be overcome in a sustainable way. We welcome ADB's cultural transformation initiative and modernization of governance and business practices to better service member countries and continue staying relevant in fast-changing environment. 
Well-informed decisions require a range of diverse perspectives to be included, and we support the efforts of Board of Directors to improve gender diversity at the Board. To maximize its impact, we seek ADB's attention on two areas. The first is regional cooperation and integration. ADB's huge convening power and experience in promoting regional cooperation and integration are more important than ever to jointly overcome common challenges and to realize that while being culturally different, we are the same and have the same responsibilities, including to each other. Second is knowledge sharing. Some of us are facing problems which have been already solved by others. Some of us are repeating mistakes of others, and we are all facing new problems that can only be solved collectively. With its regional and global perspectives, ADB is well positioned to promote social innovation and act as a knowledge sharing platform for member countries, increasing the efficiency of our efforts and encouraging cooperation so we can achieve the vision described in Strategy 2030. Mr. President, I want also to express my gratitude for all the support and effective cooperation we have had during our 17 years of membership in the Asian Development Bank. The responsiveness of ADB in combating the pandemic proved ADB's commitment to support its member countries, not only in stable, but also in emergency situations. Therefore, we always stand ready to work closely with ADB and join our efforts towards prosperous, resilient, and inclusive Asia and Pacific. Thank you, Chair. I thank the Governor of Armenia. Fellow Governors, I would like to clarify that the Asian Development Bank does not interfere in the political affairs of any member, nor is it influenced in its decision by the political character of the member concerned. I call upon the Governor for Nepal. Honorable Chair, President Mr. Asakawa, Excellency Governors, Distinguished Delegates, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to the President of ADB and the management for organizing the 55th annual meeting. I take this opportunity to extend my gratitude to the government of the Philippines and Filipino people for the hosting the wonderful event. Honorable Chair, ADB under the strong leadership of the President has shown active response during and after the period of COVID-19 pandemic through finance and knowledge. I commend the efforts put forwarded by the ADB, including strengthening food security in the region, including climate financing, exploring innovative ideas to strengthen ADB's capital adequacy and streamlining emergency energy transition mechanism, ETM. Following the COVID-19 pandemic, we are further challenged by unprecedented inflation with high cost of fuel and basic food materials due to climate change and current geopolitical conflict between Russia and Ukraine. This demand unequivocal efforts in achieving sustainable growth through innovation, inclusion, removing supply chain uh, bottlenecks, and widening domestic resource mobilization. Developing countries like Nepal bear the brunt of climate change more, whereas they are least responsible for it. The effect of a global warming in the Himalayas poses a serious threat to food, water, energy, as well as human security in the region. The strong message from the pandemic and climate in emergency have encouraged us for policy departures to our green, resilient, and inclusive economy. The environment being a global common, we urge ADB to come up with the innovative and climate smart interventions in food security and disaster management through just and fair instrument of financing and knowledge, including private sector operations. Honorable Chair, on the path of achieving sustainable development, Nepal is implementing steps to recalibrate its economy by adopting the green, resilient, and inclusive development approach. Nepal endorsed the Kathmandu Declaration and two weeks back, Mustang Summit to systematically address the impact of COVID-19 and climate emergency and moving towards the journey of greener future. Nepal aims to reach as near zero emissions by 2045. We will ensure that 15% of our total energy demand is supplied from clean energy and maintain 45% of forest coverage. 
taking this opportunity, I would like to highly appreciate the financial support extended by ADB to developing member countries including Nepal for COVID-19 vaccines as well as rehabilitation and recovery of the economy. We believe ADB has been and will remain the relevant and responsive to member countries that struggle to recover the COVID-19 pandemic and climate emergency and other multiple challenges. Finally, I am extremely thankful to Asian Development Bank for its long-standing support in Nepal's development journey. Thank you all. Thank the Governor for Nepal. I would like to thank the Governors for their remarks. All the remarks will be included in the summary of proceedings that will be prepared by the Secretary. Before we proceed to closing this session, I would like to call on the Secretary. Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, please allow us to uh, proceed to a brief ceremony. It has been our tradition uh, to pass on the baton from the chair to the chair-elect. So may I request the chair, the chair, uh, the governor for Sri Lanka, the chair-elect, the governor for the Republic of Korea, and the ADB president to come forward for the baton passing and a photo. Please. I close this session. I must add that a successful 55th session of the ADB is a tribute to our President Asakawa, who has guided the affairs in the years of the COVID pandemic. Thank you, Mr. President, <laughs> fellow, uh, fellow governors, ladies and gentlemen, I hereby declare this meeting concluded. Governors, could we please request you to remain seated uh, for a quick preview from the Korean Ministry of Economy and Finance about what is in store for the next year's annual meeting. Thank you, Governors. ago in Fiji. The Korean government held a future host country event showcasing the 2020 annual meeting in Incheon. But the annual meeting could not take place in 2020 due to COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic swept across the world and a global economic downturn ensued. We were severely and negatively affected by various unexpected risks. But we didn't despair or give up. Through prompt vaccine distribution, systematic quarantine measures, and effective policy support for vulnerable groups, we are recovering from the pandemic and the economic shocks. During the crisis, we had to be far apart from one another, but 
we have always been together in spirit. We were constantly connected online, and we aim to reconnect with you offline at the Incheon ADB Annual Meeting in 2023. We are continuously striving to build a better future after COVID-19. Korea is endeavoring to transition to a dynamic economy driven more by the private sector and the market. Korea is also strengthening its fundamentals through drastic regulatory and structural reforms, particularly in the public, labor, and education sectors. Based on our valuable experience, we wish to build hope for Asia with you. Rebounding Asia. We hope to open a new chapter for Asia with ADB members at the 2023 annual meeting in Incheon. Home to the world's beloved K-pop and K-movie, Korea invites you to come and experience the dynamics of Korean culture where the traditional and the modern come together. We await for that special day when we will meet again in Incheon, the host city for the 2023 ADB Annual Meeting. Thank you. Excellencies, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for attending the future host country event, Incheon 2023. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Ju Yan Cho, and I have been given the honor of being the master of ceremonies for this auspicious event. And allow me to introduce myself in the Korean traditional way. Thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you. We started off part one by showing a video of a special message delivered by South Korea. And now it is my honor and pleasure to introduce to you Governor Chu Kyung ho uh, the governor as well as the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Economy and Finance of the Republic of Korea for his welcome remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him with a big round of applause. Thank you. President Asakawa, distinguished governors, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for electing Korea as the chair of next year's annual meeting. The annual meeting was postponed due to the pandemic in 2020, and it will be held in Korea again after three years. This is the third annual meeting that will be held in Korea in 19 years following the meeting in Seoul in 1970 and in Jeju in 2004. Above all, I feel that it is all the more special as it will be the first face-to-face -face ADB annual meeting to be held since the pandemic. However, I am not entirely in high spirit in preparing for this event. Amid the lingering effect of the pandemic, uncertainties in the global economy are escalating, such as the spike in energy and food prices, and the financial instability in emerging economies. So the theme of the next annual meeting is to recover from the global uncertainties, reconnect closely with member countries, and reform our policies for a better future. We will make the next annual meeting a platform for Asia's rebound, sharing Korea's experience with ADB members and learning from each other's experience and concerns. In addition, 
Korea has many cultural contents that you like, such as K-movie, like Squid Games, not to mention BTS and other K-pop artists. By providing diverse events on K-culture, we will make the next meeting a platform of experience so that you could actually experience Korea, which you would have met indirectly. Ladies and gentlemen, Incheon, the host city for the next annual meeting, was the first port in Korea that was opened to the world. Connecting Korea and the world, Incheon is a place where you can experience both traditional and modern Korea, ranging from a UNESCO World Heritage Site to Songdo International City. I really look forward to all of you. I, I really look forward to meeting you, all of you again in the fascinating city of Incheon next year. Thank you so much. See you in Incheon. Thank you once again, Deputy Prime Minister Chu, for your kind remarks. And ladies and gentlemen, as he has mentioned, we wholeheartedly welcome you to Incheon, South Korea. And now it is my pleasure and honor to welcome President Asakawa, the president of the Asian Development Bank, for his congratulatory remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him with a warm round of applause. Governor Kyokon Chu, uh, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to join you for this uh, event, honoring our annual meeting host country in 2023, the Republic of Korea. I congratulate Governor Chu on his appointment as chair of the Board of Governors for 2022 to 2023. Governor Chu, I am very grateful for your offer to host the 2023 ADB annual meeting in Incheon. We hope uh, the 2023 annual meeting will enable us to reaffirm our commitment to a green, inclusive, and resilient recovery after the pandemic. The theme is Rebounding Asia, Recover, Reconnect, Reform. This captures the region's priorities quite well. The Republic of Korea will host uh, 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 the ADB annual meeting uh, for the third time. It hosted successful gatherings on Jeju Island in 24 and in Seoul in 1970, as Governor Chu mentioned. The Republic of Korea is also founding member of ADB and holds a place of distinction for its remarkable transition from borrowing member to donor. ADB is co-financing for sovereign and non-sovereign operations with the Republic of Korea totals 4.57 billion US dollars to date. In addition, we are so grateful for its contributions to the Asian Development Fund, ADF, and other ADB administrated funds. I am certain that there will be much to learn in Incheon from the development experiences and successes of the Republic of Korea. The country has deep cultural traditions and is known, well known worldwide for its cutting edge technology and pop culture. Our host city of Incheon is an example of the country's transformation into an economic powerhouse. It is an uh, international city that hosts uh, numerous high profile conferences. It is also home for international organizations including the Green Climate Fund, GCF. As you may know, Incheon was originally scheduled to be our annual meeting venue in May 2020. However, it was not possible to go ahead with an in-person annual meeting that year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But now, we can look forward, really look forward, to working with Governor Chu's team and the city of Incheon on our first 
full scale annual meeting in three years. I know it will be a success. So my friends, see you in Incheon. Thank you, President Azakawa, for your kind remarks, and we hope to see you in Incheon in the near future. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a long day. That concludes part one of our future host country event. We will start part two of our event at the staff hub. So we kindly ask you to please join us on this auspicious day. And during part two, you will be able to enjoy great traditional Korean foods, along with fabulous performances that involve Korean K-pop as well. So we would enjoy it if you could join us and sit back, relax, and enjoy the performances that we have prepared. And if you exit the auditorium, you'll also be greeted with a traditional performance by Korea called Samulori. They will lead you on to the staff hub, which is just about two minutes away from here. So with that, I will leave you with the performance, and I hope to see you at the staff hub. Thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you.